Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game Former Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Brian Shea. Hey. And Kimberly Wallace. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the big show. We're going to be covering a lot by, got it? Uh, Carter, uh, talking about Pokemon, Sword mm-hmm. and Shield. Uh, Shea, you've got to play... First hour and a half. First hour and a half. And this is separate from our ongoing month of uh, Pokemon coverage or yes. roped up into that? Well, it's separate. Okay, we'll get into all that stuff. Uh, Kim, you reviewed Trails of Cold Steel 3. Yes. Very exciting. Um, also out today, actually, is Jackbox Party Pack 6. Ooh. Um, and so it's like, hey, let's get everybody together and play it and talk about it. I wasn't invited. Well, it turns out the Game 4 office is empty. <laughs> A lot of people out. Uh, and so it's like, ah, let's get the next best thing to Game Informer folks the director of the game. Uh, so mm. we actually get a call with uh, Warren Arnold to talk about uh, what I think is the best game in the batch, which is a game very much like Avalon or kind of like social deception games like that uh, called Push the Button. So we learned about that and just kind of an overall update in all things uh, Jackbox. Will we play this at Extra Life this year? Guaranteed we're going to play it at Extra Ooh. Life this well, year. Well, I I'm will so be there excited. for that segment. Great. That's uh, November 2nd. Uh, starting at 8 a.m. Central is when we're going to do our 25-hour stream. Um, former employees will be coming back for that. Woo. Uh, so that should be a hoot. It's interesting too, like, you know, talking to the Overblood Facebook group and also just in the comments and on Twitter and stuff. I was asking like, what do you guys want this year? It is shocking the amount of people that are like, we don't want to be mean this year. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't want to torture everybody with peppers like you guys we've have already been so tortured. we've been tortured yeah the greatest ghost pepper of all <laughs> um, and so it's interesting of like how does this shift things like no matter hmm. what i think it's going to be longer game sections we already have a ton of stuff Just, to auction yeah. off as well it would be funny if we to donate money and you have to have you choose two editors to give an uncomfortably long hug to each other honestly <laughs> yeah. i think that's what we're going to do like one of the ideas <laughs> is, oh is have it like you know, if you want to choose, you can do something a little bit mean, but also giving people nice <laughs> I'm options. not used to people wanting to be nice. This I know. It's going to be mind-blowing. This is an idea from <laughs> Jojo the last year where he's like, we should do it like Paragon or Renegade options for each Ooh, donation. So that was it's my like, idea. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, sorry. It was Shay's. But Joe, <laughs> Joe is the one who said, like, we need nice options in there too, right? Yeah. Um, and so the idea of, okay, donate. And it's just five-minute back massage, oh. foot massage, stuff like that. I don't know about the foot uh, massage, I, but... I don't oh, think that sounds nice. I know nice. foot massages very well. Shay, I know. We I got think, into this on the Japan trip. Yeah, there was a lot of massaging. <laughs> That's weird. not true. That's weird. Um, <laughs> uh, speaking of weird as well, uh, on last week's episode, we had Joe Juba on, and the very idea weird. was floated. Yeah, always oh, a weird-looking guy. Uh, but we floated the idea of... Hey, Joe, you should write up your greatest tips for writing a game review. And he's like, I don't really want to write that up. Maybe we could just talk about it. Um, And so on this episode of the podcast, we have Joe Juba on for a lengthy, thorough, deep dive into how to write a video game review, which is about as inside baseball as you can get. But I think... I think people will enjoy it and get something out of it. Like, Joe's been around at Game Informer since 2004. Uh, he knows a lot about writing in general, specifically writing game reviews. And so it's a nice opportunity for him just to unload everything he has in that bald skull of his. I could probably stand to watch that segment. Yeah? yeah. What have you learned about writing reviews? <sighs> that I'm awful at it. Oh. Are you really? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very He's good at it. He's a Debbie writing. Downer. Uh, <laughs> Kim, is he bad at writing reviews? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What what have you improved in? How do you feel like you're off? I think that uh, for me, when I first joined Game Informer, it was more about like finding like the right way to approach a criticism rather than like like unifying my voice while keeping my own. You know, like making it sound like a Game Informer review while not losing my critical voice. And did you feel like you were really sensitive to feedback early on? Like every pass of a review. When people gave you feedback, it hurt. No, oh. I, I I worked freelance before this, so like oh, I sure. was used to like getting just torn to shreds. Right, right. And also all throughout middle school and high school. Oh yeah, and in my personal like, life, I mean, that's never sorry, happened. And then this ever, podcast so. just I I can't I can't relate. <laughs> yeah, uh, Shay, I'm sorry. Apparently, that whispering segment was mean to you. On people were not happy. About they were not pleased. <laughs> I thought it was the absurdity of the whispering, but I guess the whispering in itself was <laughs> insulting, which I did not consider. It's okay. I was very, very distraught, and I drank myself into a coma that night. So. See, this is what Shay does, Kim. I know. I told you Debbie Downer. <gasps> he like, does wait, this you're Debbie not whispering, Downer stuff. so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. can, can we talk about Shay a little bit? Because <laughs> he does this all the time where he's like, oh, sad sack me. He's Eeyore. And then, but then you try and talk to him about it, and he just laughs it off. 
And it's very frustrating. Yeah. It's like, if you want to be a sad tag, hey guys, can I whisper? I can I whisper? Hang on, I hear something. Yes. We cope in different ways. Some people cope by talking, right? Kim? Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. You should open up more shades. But that's my point. Ben, I would like to break the fourth wall here for a second, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. Oh it is a okay. Let's go back to the podcast. <laughs> Wait, that's your breaking of the yeah, fourth wall? Yeah, that is not what I expected. Shay. It is A-OK. It is A-OK. Wait, they're Deadpool over here. <laughs> Watch out, folks. That famous scene in Deadpool 2. Red hot. <laughs> uh, anyways, community emails, uh, middle of the show, back half of the show. Again, we're just packing this episode full. Um, we have an interview about the Outer Worlds. Very yeah. exciting. It's coming out next week, for Christ's sake. Wow. Uh, and so we have the co-game director, Leonard Boyarsky, also oh, the nice. co-creator of Fallout. Um, from Obsidian. He was on the podcast back during the cover story. It'll be nice to catch up with him again. We also have the game's narrative designer on as well, just to talk about what it was like to wrap up that project and get it out the door. So it'll be fun to check in with those folks. Um, Okay. In addition to all the games we want to talk about, there's also like three bigger news stories this week. Mm -hmm. Kim, you don't need to monologue about these, but I'm curious, what are you more interested in out of these options? Uh, announcement of an analog pocket, which we'll explain, uh, chapter two of Fortnite and the way that was revealed, or Riot Games announcing more games. Riot Games announcing more games. Isn't that wild? Like, seems like the most, out of those titles you gave, like the most generic, like, okay, yeah, Riot announced more games. I expected that, but it was just like, you didn't expect it when it came, I think, too. It was no. like late last night and all yeah. of a sudden, like, my... Twitter's blowing up with it everybody exploded. Being like, yeah. yeah, I was like, why is everyone talking about Riot? It's like, oh, they show glimpses of a fighting game and uh, the, a new anime or a new like yeah, uh, an animated an, show. Anime, that a new documentary. Right, and also, uh, this is maybe most exciting for you, Kim, what they're calling, what, a tactical first-person shooter game? Character-based. Okay. Tactical. <laughs> yeah, get, get, get also, right. yeah. with unique abilities for every character. It looks very Overwatchy, but almost like a more... Military. It looks like okay. a Counter Strike meets Overwatch almost. I was going to say Rainbow Six. Okay. Mm-hmm. Siege meets Overwatch. But I was more impressed or more surprised than when I saw a former Overwatch animator that I follow on Twitter say that they were working on the game as well. No. Mm. Yeah. So it's like there's at least a little bit of talent bleeding mm-hmm. over into that. And so, hey, the idea of Riot, the creator of League of Legends, making. Uh, a lot of Blizzard competitors, it and seems all of like. these based in the League of Legends universe. So, like building, a I said, not giant the tactical universe. one. Okay, well, I guess I'll but just everything go leave else, now. including mm-hmm. like the the card game, which they also announced. Yep. Yeah, uh, Legends of Runeterra. Yes, when the game League of Legends has been generating more money than God, and we just mm-hmm. keep hearing, you know, whispers about yeah. how many projects are being started up within Riot and then killed, and then starting up and yeah. killed, and they have a uh, friend of the show, Seth Killian, fighting game expert, hired him a little while mm-hmm. ago, um, and now it's like, oh, we finally saw a glimpse of they are, in fact, making a League of Legends fighting game, which yeah. is very exciting. And uh, another game that they just have no details on whatsoever, they don't even, they didn't even tell us what genre it is. That one overhead confusing one? Yeah, it was like, uh, it's saying something like it's going to give you a new way to explore Runeterra with friends. Oh, look it's at that. It's like, hmm, finally. <laughs> Pre-order now. Um, it's exciting. And they said, oh, 2020, we're going to be showing more mm-hmm. and explaining more of what this stuff is. The weirdest one. I don't know if you caught this. It was Please. like a footnote in the press release when I was writing this up last night. Uh, League of Legends eSports manager. Did you see this? Mm-mm. You're running a team, like, like you know, you've seen, like, Football Manager from Sega, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that's who does that, uh, where you're just running a team. Like, that's what that is. Like, you really? sign pros, like, real oh League of God, Legends pros. Oh, my God, I need pros, to play this. This sounds amazing. And, Would like, you really be into that? And yeah. you, like, create your esports team, and it, like, actually has, like, real, like, licensed, like, pro gamers. Uh-huh. And apparently, according to the press release, money is going to be shared with the teams that are in the game, to help expand like the, the reach roster? of League of Legends esports. Oh man. So like they're Wait reinvesting the money from this game into the League of Legends esports scene. Is it only League of Legends people and it'll like simulate I right, matches yeah, I mean, from them? I don't know. I don't know how that works, but like we'll I, have, I'm like assuming... AI equivalents of like certain players? Yeah, like I don't know, I don't know League of Legends player Shaft. Right. I don't know what what are, what are their names in the League of Legends it's esports? A lot of shafts. Okay. Um so it'll have like, oh no, we've simulated uh, this player shouted liberate Hong Kong and what do we do? <laughs> like, is it going to have those types I don't of like know. quirks? I think that'd be really interesting. I'm like, oh, he's a like, gamer like moment. With, what like, are you going to do? You're dealing with, I, I doubt they have that since they want, they, they're actually licensing these players. I bet that like if Shaft was like, oh, my guy said 
the N word on stream. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're getting out of control here. <laughs> Whew, I prefer when you use the A word, A OK. I think there'd be cool <laughs> things if, like, your guy broke his hand or something. And it's like you have to find a replacement. Like, yeah, that, that type of stuff I think they'd be OK with. But, like, like, it's like in Madden. Well, this guy hasn't slept in like three days, and now you guys have a tournament coming up, and he just is not <laughs> as, you know. Yeah, I think you're going to have to wait for, like, to be. Blitz the Esports League to there get all that stuff. There is a lot of potential here with the different dilemmas. So I love these types of simulations. Games. Really? I like managing stuff uh, that's like in uh, my sports games, like the main mode I play is franchise because uh -huh. yeah. I like to be in control of everything. And uh, I like when you have to solve those like problems when players come to you and are like, hey, I'm not getting enough playing time and whatever. So I think it's really cool to see that play out in an esports scene because yeah. it hasn't been done before, uh, yeah, really. And that just, I'm, I'm excited. That was definitely the weirdest announcement, yeah. I think, out of it's all of them. It's weird, but I think it sounds cool. Cool. Also, a console MOBA, like League of Legends Wild Rift is what it's called. And oh, it's, really? Yeah, oh, I missed this. It, and Team Fight Tactics is coming to mobile. Uh, okay. So, but League of Legends Wild Rift, it's a 5v5 MOBA, and like it's rebuilt from the ground up, and it's designed for consoles and mobile, and it's like 15 to 18 minute matches. Oh, that's really interesting. But yeah, I guess it's coming out in 2020. So is it kind of like the Civ Rev equivalent to League of Legends? I guess. <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, well, I, I, mobile is coming out in 2020. I didn't say sure. when console's coming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Kim, are you like a micromanager in real life too? Like when you're going on vacation or something? It's yes. like, I'm making the effing schedule. Yep. Sit back and enjoy it. I'm annoying like that. Oh, that's fun. That's how I'm organized in my life. I uh -huh. don't know. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Kim, which story do you hate the most? The announcement of the analog pocket or talking about Fortnite? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, we were talking about Fortnite, I think. Okay. Well, let's... Just because it was everywhere and just kind of, at the time, annoying. <laughs> at the time, annoying. I think it's really it's cool, exciting. Even though but... I don't really play Fortnite mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. But really, I mean, uh, play it at all anymore. Um, but the announcement that, not even the announcement, but just all of a sudden a black hole consumes the map, consumes all the players. It's literally like having a cutscene just in the middle of a match. And then Fortnite went offline for, what, 30 hours? Like 30, yeah. 30 36 well, hours. Well, I think that was like the that. thing that was uh, just watching that unfold on Twitter and have a bunch of people be like, it's over. It's no way. It can't be over. And just seeing the different, you know. Also, I saw like it was funny, like the PlayStation support tweeted out, like, yeah. contact Epic. Don't blame PlayStation yeah, for not being able exactly. to play Fortnite. Exactly. I just like people <laughs> losing their minds. Yeah. Uh, is is pretty. I'm like, come on, common sense. They're not gonna get rid of Fortnite. I but did I like the it. tweet that was like, it would be the most baller move ever if Epic was just like delete Fortnite at the top of the game. Like, right, screw right. you guys. I mean, that would be the most baller <laughs> move ever. But still, taking such a huge money maker mm -hmm. and a game that requires constant updates and just pulling the plug on it for a while and having the messaging of <clears throat> it's the end of Fortnite, everybody. A lot of you snobs wanted it. Now it's out there. Like that is such an awesome way to then introduce a new map and get yeah. attention. And I yeah. mean, realistically it was taken down for server maintenance while they introduced all this new stuff. And the, the way they did it was like, Hey, if we do like a viral event where it just it gets was, sucked into super, a black it was hole. Super yeah. smart, it was which is brilliant. Like I said, yeah. Yeah. If you're always so good about that, like with like the, the giant cube that appeared last year. And right. Like, but this just dwarfs everything. Oh, in terms of, of an interesting thing. And like, even if you're not in a Fortnite, Fortnite. I think just to understand the capability of live games at this point, yeah. you should look at like a YouTube clip of what the end of the world looked like in Fortnite. Like it's really it awesome. Cool. Yeah. You can go to GameInformer.com and see a video. Oh my gosh. That sounds great. Um, also, Shay, the Analog Pocket was announced yesterday. What's that like? Yeah. So it is, it looks like a little like a modernized slimline Game Boy Color or Game Boy Pocket. Yeah. Uh, super, super sleek looking. I guess it comes in white and black uh, and it's, it, it plays all games from Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance natively, so no emulation required. That's the odd part, right? Yeah. No emulation. So you can just plug any cartridge into there from yeah. those three libraries, and then they also are going to have cartridge adapters for uh, Neo Geo Pocket, Game Gear, and Atari Lynx, and potentially other handheld devices, which I'm, yeah. I can't even name another one, I don't think. Uh, Wonder Swan. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, so in addition to playing all those games emulation free, just natively, you also get, uh, there's a synthesizer, so you can make your own music. Yeah. And then there's an additional development chip on there, so you can like, people who know their way around a, a development unit can make their own games on this thing. It's also. so awesome. And also, and there's an attachment for an analog dock. So yeah. you can like dock it like the Switch and then play these Game Boy games. And you can use like a Bluetooth a controller or there's two USB 
uh, cool. ports as well. So you can play it up on your TV through HDMI. It looks so and good. A 3.5 inch LCD or LED LCD uh, screen, and mm -hmm. it has 10 times the resolution of like the original Game Boy. Like, so you can see all the yeah. butt green and high. <laughs> Did def. they give a price point? Two hundred dollars, but the dock is sold separately, as are the cartridge adapters for the other, like the right. non Game Boy mm -hmm. systems. Do you feel like? This eats any potential lunch from Nintendo if they were to release a Game Boy Classic? I don't think so, because like mm. they released the Super NT and the Mega SG, which yeah. are the Super NES and Sega Genesis versions of this uh, along like around the same times that those classic consoles came out. And I think people were still pretty excited and fairly unaware of these <laughs> systems. Right. Like it's the definitely the anyway. hardcore high end. Yeah, this is like more, if you want pristine versions of playing these. So, I mean, old the games. emulation on the Genesis Mini and the uh, like the SNES Mini are incredible, but like playing it natively, and it's like also this is substantially more expensive than any yeah. of those like classic consoles, and you actually have to own the physical cartridge so like right. you can buy the $200 uh, analog pocket but you're still gonna have to go hunt down that copy of Pokemon Red or whatever which is kind of fun it's like a Pokemon hunt in of its own Ooh. Uh, very exciting uh, hey look at this segue Pokemon uh, <laughs> it's a subtle hint is where we're going Pokemon Sword and Shield so you got to play the first hour and a half yes I did okay you uh, sent me a message over Slack saying hey this game's really good mm -hmm. I was curious because I feel like we've seen a lot of it we played through a gym and stuff at E3. They've had demos out there. But what struck you about playing the first hour and a half? You're like, actually, this is better than I was expecting. Well, I think that like Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee set an expectation for like, all right, it's going to feel like Pokemon. And, you know, just like, all right, this is Pokemon on a console. And there's some like some compromises you make in, in that formula. Frame rate? Frame rate was actually fine. Okay. Uh, in I played docked uh, Sword and Shield, and also I, I played with the Pro Controller, which is something you couldn't Ooh, do. Yeah. Let's go Pikachu oh, and that's Eevee. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, so I played Sword, um, and I think that what was most interesting was they really, and I'm, I'm saying this relative to other Pokemon games, they really went for it cinematically. Like instead of like starting with like a weird like, all right, the professor's just standing there on the screen talking to me, telling me about the world of Pokemon. Uh -huh. It's like. You walk out and like, or like uh, Chairman Rose, who's the the head of the Pokemon League and Galar, walks out into like a stadium full of like cheering people, and he's like explaining like, oh, you know, we live in this magical world of Pokemon, and <laughs> that's he's... like somebody like if the Super Bowl started <laughs> with just the president walking out and explaining <laughs> Earth. Yeah. Like, that's the dumbest it, it, idea. It, it's a cool like it's like a TV broadcast style, uh -huh. and then it, it starts with like a battle between uh, Leon, who's the Pokemon League champion, yeah. and another gym leader who I. I can't mention okay uh and um yeah it's just kind of a cool like all right it sets the tone for like the sporting atmosphere that they're really going for and also like they're making it look like there's more going on in this world than just like you know it's it's not just all right a professor sitting down and having a talk with you in a, a sterile white room yeah uh which is kind of nice and then uh it's just it, it, everything, like everything from like the transitions from like the overworld to a battle. Like there's yeah. like, it, it's smooth and like obviously they have to load the the battle screen, but like they the like the trainer screen that pops up in the transition is like makes it feel a lot more seamless. Okay. And um. It, the uh the wild area is the most interesting yes, part of this game. I agree. Do you get to it in the first hour and a half? How open I got is to the it. game? You got to it. Oh I great. Got to it. I walked okay. around. Um. It's cool because you're walking around. It it, it feels big and uh and, and it is pretty wide open there's different biomes in there different weather and as you cross through these different biomes is it just one big space in it the is world so map? like in the world map like there's like a big like like rectangular kind of area and then it uh -huh. like kind of branches up the side so you can journey further north in it as well um so yeah it's it i didn't explored extensively because I was running pretty low on time. One of yeah. my main goals in this t like hands-on time was to see the first evolution of Sobble, who was the Pokemon I chose. Yeah. I did not get to do that. I, at a certain point, I had to throw in the towel with the grinding because I was like, I'm going to run out of time I and I'm not going to get to the wild area. I think build, right? It wouldn't be like, oh, you happen to level it up so you get the first exclusive reveal I, of Sobble. Well, I mean, I probably wouldn't be able to mention it anyway. They were, they were very uh -huh. uh, careful about like what the I Pokemon can and Company? can't mention. <laughs> that sounds bizarre. 
uh, yeah, there was a lot of Pokemon that I encountered that I'm not uh, at liberty to speak about. Okay, I don't care about that. Uh, were you <laughs> impressed by, by you know the, the mysterious Pokemon you encountered? Is a lot of throwbacks? Is a lot of new stuff? There are some Pokemon that I encountered that are uh, returning, and uh, I can mention right. that I caught a Yamper, which is like the Corgi. You the, what? <laughs> the electric Corgi yeah. type Pokemon. Uh, we could mention that uh, in the trailer they released yesterday, uh, they showed a bunch more uh, Gigantamax. Gigantamax so we have, versions. What, Pikachu, Charizard, Butterfree, and Meowth? Uh, yes, I believe so. And the Butterfree is such a funny choice until I looked at the Reddit and they're like, oh, they're going for Mothra. It's like, oh, of course. Oh. Like turning Butterfree into Mothra connection either. is a very funny idea. Yeah. Uh, and Charizard, like the huge version of Charizard, looks awesome. It's like yeah. flame wings on its back. It looks so much cooler than Mega Charizard. Mm-hmm. Actually, I like the black Mega Charizard. Okay. Um, Meowth looks uh, horrific, so <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so uh, after the wild area, I got to Motostoke, which is the city that we actually got a tour of in the Maya file. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you check out GameFormer.com or GameFormer's YouTube channel, we had posted a video called Visiting... Uh, Game Freak, essentially, for Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, And in that, it's kind of like, I know. (laughs) It's a travelogue, but then within that, buried in there, if you're willing to take the plunge and look at a bunch of photos of Brian Che touring Japan, in the middle of it, we show off like a cool behind-the-scenes tour of a town that apparently is called Motostoke. You really buried the lead in that video. I know. I liked it, though. (laughs) I don't think it was misleading because I just didn't want hardcore Pokemon fans to be like, what's this? I don't care about you and Shibuya. I want to know about the evolutions. Like, yeah, that's fair. This is a different type of video, but there's still some kernels in there that are interesting. Yeah. I think. We get to see us make a league card. You get to see us tour the Motostoke Maya file. Mm-hmm. You get uh, to see Brian Shade lose in Street Fighter in a Japanese yes. arcade. After I beat you. Uh-huh. Move on. Okay, so you went to Motostoke. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I didn't really have any time to like do anything, but I, like, I, <laughs> I walked around the streets. I saw like, oh, because like they, if you remember in our cover trip, they removed some stuff Yes. From before we could start filming. That's right. And I was like looking at some of the stuff they removed and I was like, oh, that's because they haven't announced that Pokemon that's on the, ah. that poster yet. Oh, okay. Um, and so like I ran around the streets a little bit. It, it, it's a pretty large city and like the buildings, the sense of scale that you get with the buildings in this game are so much more striking than like what you get in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee because like... Yeah. There's not many huge buildings in red and blue because of like the technology at the time. Like you know, you can get to the department store exactly. and everything, which is huge. But like, you don't feel that sense of scale because the camera is still like kind of mm-hmm. yeah. But like with this, like I walked up to the gym and I'm like, holy hell, this thing is like just a massive. How's the camera? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it the only time you can really control it is in the wild area. That's you can so use like the right stick to like it? rotate around and How everything. does that work? Is it a separate load or is it just once you mm-hmm. cross the threshold of going into the wild area? No, it's area? a separate load. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um okay, so overall better than you expected and you're already looking forward to it. I'm very much looking forward to it. Okay. Anything you're worried about? I'm worried about the tech personally. I don't know how it's going to run in handheld. Uh I Played it in dock using a pro controller, uh, but they did have shields. I was playing sword up on the screen, and they had shield running on a switch light, hmm. and like the title screen looked fine. I didn't have a chance <laughs> to play it, but like it wasn't hey, like chugging along screen. or anything. And uh, uh, the title screen was at least one frame per no, second. No, it, it was uh, it was smooth and everything. Like there's like particle effects on the title oh, okay. screen, yeah, and yeah. Uh, but I didn't have a chance to play because I was trying to get as much like gameplay content as possible. Sure, sure. that sounds great. Um, so at the end of the day, just to break the fourth wall here. It's say okay It's say okay Great. Um, Kimberly Wallace, mm-hmm. Trails of Cold Steel 3. Yes. We, my little series that I champion uh-huh. every chance I get. This, is, this has been a journey. We've covered each and every one on this podcast. This is now the final entry in no. the... No. Oh. It's the third. There's one more after this. Oh, I thought I heard Joe saying yeah, this was idiot. the end or something. No. Oh, well, he's a maniac. <laughs> Trails of Cold Steel Joe 3. Joe doesn't even know that series. He Why thinks would he, he say knows the end? everything. There's another one. Okay, so this is RPG available on what platforms? PS4. Just PS4. Yeah, and you can, so it's, as I said, there's two previous games, uh, obviously, because it's three, Yeah. but you can, they've now been remastered, so you can play those on PS4, because originally it was PS3 and Vita that the past ones came on to, and so now you have the opportunity to catch up on the series if you haven't, which I recommend. Everybody always asks me, can I just jump into the third game and... God, there is so much story in this game that that's a huge disservice. And part of what is great about it is 
seeing all the returning characters and just this sprawling. St- I mean, this goes back to stuff that happened in like Trails in the Sky. So we're like, so that going is the same way- universe. Yes. And Trails in the Sky was the one that looked a lot like Star Ocean. Yes. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that was one that everybody was really charmed by way back. And then Cold Steel was like the next arc in that. I mean, so you'll see sometimes, you'll even hear about characters and see some characters from that um, whole thing with Trails in the Sky, which is okay. cool. Yeah. So if, you're, if you've been following it, it's just cool because there's a lot of little nods. Um, but a lot has happened in this world. And there is a backstory thing you can go to in the menu, which will catch you up. Like it gives pretty, I was looking at just like how thorough the explanations were for if someone was coming into it. And like I said, it, it, it's good. It does have a lot. It like has character profiles, this or this. It's like suspicious character. I'm like, what, you know, just kind of leading you in directions to know kind of what fans have been like, oh my God, what's going on here? Yeah. But still like this whole game is about building relationships and getting to know that cast and just seeing how that all unfolds through each game, I feel like is really important. Like for me, even it was like a year and a half since the events of the second game and the class seven had graduated and just seeing where different characters ended up and how they came into the story was yeah. like, those were the most awesome moments of the game. You're not feeling um, schooled out. Cause it's, is it still a school setting? Yeah. I actually commented on that because well, it's a new, you have a new, class seven this time around because reen has since graduated uh you know after he put a stop to that civil war that was going on Thank he's God. seen as a hero and he decides like he goes into a different branch of the academy that's for outcasts and misfits and uh mm-hmm. decides to be a professor so he takes the professor role and you kind of see him learning how to cope with that and teach um new students who all kind of have their own own issues going on or trying to figure out, you know, who they're going to be, which I Mm -hmm. always like. I always liked the school setting, but what I'll say about Cold Steel 3 is it has similar problems that the other games have had. It's just, it's, you have to be able to be somebody who can tolerate a very slow burn. Mm -hmm. Like the story, it's all good for the buildup and the relationships, but even sometimes for me, I'm just like, I've played this game like for 10 hours today and I don't feel like I've even oh, advanced no. anywhere in the story, but I've learned a lot about these characters and where it's going on. So, yeah. cause you'll like finish up like a mission or a boss battle and then you'll just have like all this downtime to just where you just have to go. Now I have to talk to this character. Now I have to talk to that character. Now I go back here uh, and you don't do anything like really for like 10, 15 minute periods. And then it's just okay. like, it, but, so, but, that's but like you the like one it thing. overall still. Yeah, I, you know what? It, what I feel like it does so well is it reminds me of like the classic, you know, JRPGs of yesteryear. But well, f- where Falcom is really smart is that they've modernized things pretty well. I mean, playing it, you will feel like compared to anything else um, right now, it will feel like a little bit of a dated experience. But yeah. Even, I don't know. A lot of people are playing Dragon Quest XI right no, now. That's what I'm Switch, saying. Like so, that's yeah. what I kept thinking of. Is like that and Dragon Quest XI mm-hmm. are those you know turn based uh, RPGs that have just done a really good job of like you know help people who want that experience. So if you're you know me and I feel like this also Cold and Steel. And we are. Cold Steel has one of the best turn based battle systems that I think it's my favorite of recent years. Like it's just more than Persona Five. Yeah. Wow. Because, wow. Well, because it does a lot of stuff. Like, it always is adding on extra layers. So, if, for instance, for this one, um, you can now, if you deal enough damage with your specials and everything, you can break an enemy. So, you do break damage, which then multiplies the amount of damage that you can put out. You have these... Um, these tide changing perks that you can um, enact in battle, which like would be like for four turns, I can reflect all damage and they become really vital to whether or not you succeed in a boss battle. Like the battles in general are challenging. And I'm as somebody who plays a lot of JRPGs. I love that. I still like can sit there and be like, God, I just didn't put these two things together. Well, or I should have used that move there. And you know, and if you do get frustrated, there's always the option to weaken enemies and try again. So it never yeah. forces you into a grind if you want to. But I'm just saying, it's just, there's a lot of good parts to that battle system. Placement matters, you know, paying attention to turn orders. Each turn has the ability to like, sometimes you'll get a critical that you can see is coming up on a turn or, you know, the enemies going to use an art because zero, like you don't have to pay anything for it, whatever. Like there's just a lot of cool bonuses and 
and stuff as you go on. So it's like, it's unpredictable and I, I just love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What score did you give it? Eight. Eight. Trails of Cold Steel 3. I feel like it's a tall order to be like, you want a retro style RPG that's pretty solid? Just buy this and then also buy the first two Trails of Cold Steel. You'll still be missing out on the you know, Trails in the Sky story. Like it is... It is a lot to chew on. It is. On. It, and even me going through it, it is a life like, oh my God, they have introduced, if you think, so many characters into this series and yeah. just like, whew, I thought uh, I thought I had a lot to keep track of in Kingdom Hearts. Um, oh, way, really? way more here. Oh God. More like characters the, in Kingdom just, Hearts? Yeah, way more. Oh like, my God. There's, there's, and they even go, they like up the ante in this <clears> one. <throat> there's just so many new characters that they introduce in, you know, addition to having all these returning characters. It's uh, quite an expansive story, but kind of cool to see how that history and lore has just played into this massive thing, mm -hmm. um, which I said, you don't have to know every little detail to enjoy it or yeah, by any yeah. means, but there's payoff in having followed those characters right as on. far as you do. Trails of Cold Steel 3, reviews on the site. Uh, Brian Shea, have you checked out Ring Fit Adventure yet? No. What the hell, man? <laughs> oh, I let damn. you borrow that. Shay, eh. you're just full of disappointment. I have it at my today. desk right now. <laughs> Please play it. I'll play it at my desk right now. It looks like you've been pushing too many pencils over there. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that means. Uh, your arms are thin. Oh and man. Scrawny. Wow. And I could beat you in an arm wrestling match any day. We gotta try it again. <laughs> yeah, let's try it again. I've played Ring Fit Adventure now, so okay. I think I could take you. Uh, okay. Um, do you guys want to come back for community emails later? Yeah, why not? We okay, could. for now, uh, let's go on an adventure and, and talk to Warren Arnold about designing what I think is the best game in Jackbox Party Pack 6. So do you guys want to clap out? Cool. Warren Arnold, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. It's an honor <laughs> to have you. We're looking for an expert on Jackbox Party Pack 6, and you seem well, like the person know. to go to. <laughs> How long have you been at the studio? Uh, I started in 2012 when we were still part of Jelly Vision, and uh, we were making You Know Jack on Facebook. So I hired him as a writer for that, and then been kind of back and forth. And then we went to Jackbox, I think 2014, and been kind of, you know, here ever since. Yeah. Uh, uh, what here. games have you directed in the Party Packs in the past? Uh, just Patently Stupid before that. So mm. I did writing on all the games. Then last year, uh, I switched over to directing on Patently Stupid. So. I love Patently Stupid. Oh, Congratulations. <laughs> uh, here's the thing, though. I am so annoyed by people that do like the present this for me option. I want oh, to yeah. kick them out of my effing house. Is it okay <laughs> to shame those people that do the auto joke, auto tell, even in joke boat, when people don't tell their own jokes? I'm like, what are we playing the game for then, everybody? <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to say I agree because we built those features. and <laughs> For but, power. Yeah, it is kind of a point sometimes I feel like it's like, yeah, just go for it. Try it out. So Right. It's like going out to karaoke and then if there's like a sing for me option. Let's just play the actual song. I'll just sit here and listen to the song. <laughs> you know what? I think you're onto something. There. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what's the process like for um, internally just stepping up to direct a game? Is it just if you pitch a game, you get to direct it in the party pack? Or is it... Uh, you know, like a Pixar short situation where just you choose different talent to step up and direct a game within the studio? Uh, yeah, so uh, Allard LeBond typically is kind of the shepherd of that. And it's we try to find people who kind of have an affinity for certain games. Sometimes it is, it will be that way. Like uh, Spencer Ham, say, would pitch a game like um, Survive the Internet. And then that's his baby. He understands it, so it makes sense for him to direct it. Sometimes someone pitches a game, but they don't want to direct or, or whatever the case may be. And they'll be like, well, who do you think, or who do we think internally would, you know, shepherd this through the process? Well, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, like, and I pitched push the button, I believe two years ago, and it, it's like a whole process to get it to where it is now. It's gone through so many iterations. Um, so it just made sense, like, you know, for me to, you know, stick with it and get it to where it needed to be. Does it so ever yeah, it's, it can be kind of loosey goosey, but most of the time, if someone's like, you know, had directed before or is interested in becoming a director and they pitch a game, there's a good chance, you know, they might get tasked to do that if they're open to it. So, yeah. And it's got to be amazing for everybody in that studio just to like have the idea of you directing a game on your resume. Not that anybody would ever leave the studio, but just that idea, right? Of like, there's no quicker way to come into a studio and then direct a game, get that experience, you know, and then it's just really helpful for moving on. Like how big of a difference is it directing a game versus just writing for a game? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's big. Uh, Cause I'm like, I, I, we don't really call ourselves like lead writers or anything like that, but especially before we hired more writers, some of us would have to like kind of, you know, kind of take a bigger lead on a game. 
And so you're while you're cranking out content, make sure the voice stays consistent. The directors obviously have to like make sure the art is flowing in a certain direction. Make sure just the overall holistic approach is going the way it should. Whereas when I was a writer, I'd be like, well, I'm sure the art will turn out great. I'm going to focus on these jokes for two months. Like, <laughs> so yeah. you kind of like silo yourself a little bit to get like that big core of work done. Yeah. yeah directing is like just making sure the whole team is, you know, where they need to be and empowered to do. Cause that's one thing with our games too. I feel like it's, and having never worked at another game studio, um, I always just assume the director's job, maybe it's like a movie where it's like, well, I see it. My vision is this and my vision is that. And that's the way it's going to be. And while there is a little bit of that, it's, it's everybody touching these games has a little bit of their soul sucked into them a little bit. Otherwise they just wouldn't get done and they wouldn't be as fun and as vibrant as they are. Yeah. And you talk about, I think that's a hard thing with a director is making sure everybody is represented in those. For sure. And you talk about, you know, just kind of managing the art and overseeing the art. I mean, I think just the production values, like the last three years or so with the party packs have just been really, really impressive. And like, I love party pack six, but that was one of the big takeaways is playing is like, God, still just for a game that's largely text-based, just the presentation is so good. Yeah, it's the artist uh, and the art and the music, like it, everything blows me away about the work we do sometimes. Like, I'm really amazed at the talent we have. But like this year with the art, I was like, we had a uh, uh, for Push the Button Bruno came on and the, the, he came out with like these old 3D models. And I was like, we can do that. <laughs> he's like, yeah, it's like, it's pretty easy. I was like, well, that's what we're going to do then if you can finish it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. All right, let's let's walk through the evolution of of push the button. Uh, oh, it's my, God. Yeah. It's my How favorite. Long do you have? Um, you know, we got all the time in the world. That's fine. Um, it's it's my favorite out of the pack. Like I love social deception games. Like Avalon oh, okay. is it has been one of my favorite tabletop games of all time. And so for years now, I've been like, God, why won't Jackbox try and do this? It seems right there. And you you all got close with fake in it. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, from Jackbox Party Pack 3, I think, where it's kind of inching in that direction. It just didn't quite capture what we were looking for. And now finally, you guys have ripped off the bandaid and I think pulled it off in a really spectacular way. So, okay, walk me through your, your interest in this type of game, the social deception game. Uh, well, a lot of it comes from faking it. Like uh, me personally, I had not played a lot of social deduction games and then, until I worked here. And then everybody's like, oh, like, let's play, you know, this. Let's play Secret Hitler. That We really love that. We know the guys over there at Cards. Um, so that was always fun. We'd play that on like Friday afternoons and scream and yell at each other. And then when faking it came out, uh, the summer we were working on that, I was uh, writing a bunch for faking it. And faking it was one of my favorite things in the world to write on. Uh, just because, like with something, say, like, you know, Jack, I'm going to spend most of my day thinking of, like, four questions. <laughs> and like, okay, how do I twist this and make it satisfying? With faking it, I would sit and be like, who in the room has the smelliest poops? <laughs> <laughs> and so just trying to think of, like, that fun aspect that faking it's trying to go for. And then when we were able to play it that holiday season, just had, like, some of the biggest laughs in the room. And I was like, this is this is great. This is something that we need to try to capture in some way. And like, it's like Arnie did such a great job of bringing that side of like, ah, oh, busted into one of our games. So then uh, when we were back in the pitching season, I was like, you know, I love faking it. I want to try to like keep exploring that, that vein of ideas. But not and call it faking it too. Yeah. Well, yeah, there was kind of, I think we thought about that. I think my original thing was like, well, what if faking it had drawing? What if faking it had a little bit more of like a quiplash or something like that in it? And I was just trying to think of like, what else? And with faking it, obviously it's like, okay, in round one, we caught the faker. Let's move on to round two, someone else. And I was just trying to think like, well, it would be neat if it was like one or two people the entire time you have to find them. I'm also, uh, a big fan of the movie, uh, the thing from like back in the eighties, like, I mean, everybody knows it, but, uh, well, I saw it as a kid when I was like seven and I've just been like obsessed with that movie. I just love the test scene. So it was just kind of a natural, like thematic thing. I was like, okay, well, let's say you have a certain amount of time. You have to test them and we'll use our drawings and all the things that make our Jackbox games like so silly and fun. And that was, I pitched that for party pack four. And it has gone through, everybody in the office got sick of me <laughs> playtesting push the button because it just never was quite right. Yeah. We'd always get to a place where if you're playing as the alien, you would be found out in like two minutes. <laughs> because the clues and, were too different? 
Uh, yeah. So it'd be okay. the thing of like, oh, draw Napoleon and then you might get, you know, draw Abraham Lincoln or something trying to fool it. But like there was no there was no way to hide. Yeah. So the second you were found out, it's like, OK, well, I guess the game's over and we did it with six minutes to spare. Right. And then we had make some tweaks and it'd be like way too easy for the aliens then to just run out the clock. And so we we tried so many variations and different things. Um, and then. Last year, it got really close to what it is now, where you start working with like hacks and things like that, and just trying to empower the aliens a little bit without making it incredibly difficult for humans. And then this year, Evan Jakover uh, wanted to kind of revisit it. I was kind of a little bit burnt out on it, I feel, because it's like I've tried so many things, and you still want to be unique and jackboxy without seeming like another game. And then he came up with the idea of like, okay, you get to pick whatever test you want, Aliens can hack, and we just kind of went through this whole thing of like choosing rooms and stuff like that, and that just really kind of then cracked the code a little bit for us. So it was such a revelation to be like, yes, we're finally going to make this game. <laughs> this is about a 50-50. <laughs> yeah. So originally, did it have like uh, the art style from the thing? Did you want to really pull from that directly in the early days? Uh, a little bit. I was. I think more that I was just trying to get across like a sense of uh, claustrophobia, like where it's. I I remember originally it was like you've landed on a planet. And your ship is going to explode because the computer had found out there's an alien there. If the alien gets out, it's going to, like, kill the planet. There's some weird, stupid narrative that does not work. People but don't like head, the lore. The What's that? I said, people don't like the lore in Jackbox games. <laughs> so, yeah, the setup, I got it. The intro, yeah, let's get to the laughs here. That's the thing, yeah. I just had this whole overbaked thing in my head. Um, but it was, yeah, it's like you've landed on a planet, but before you can get out of your ship, like you have to find the alien or not. We have to do the quarantine, just blow everything up. And I'm not really sure if I had an aesthetic of mine. I just wanted to make sure everyone's stuck in a room or a confined space where you can't just leave. Right. That was like, I think that was the only thing in my head, but yeah. Okay. And so it was sci-fi yeah. from the beginning then? Uh, yeah. So that was, yeah, it's, it all started with drawing is where it was. It was always going to be a drawing game. And then like, so we opened it up and then we didn't even put the, opinion hold and uh, deliberation deck in till this year so oh, it's wow. just something weird. we weren't we weren't even sure if they worked really we were changing some of the rules up until like the final week so <laughs> <laughs> uh so what is the the magic of having prompts that are just close enough mm-hmm. like is there any i don't know rules you put in place of just how to write those style of prompts. Like one that we got was like, draw a Pikachu versus draw a rat being struck by lightning. Cause that's the <laughs> diabolical part is sometimes if you're the alien and you get the prompt and it says, draw a rat being struck by lightning. It's like, what could everybody else possibly have? Or I think, yeah. I think one that I got was like, uh, draw the least used emoji, something like that. Right. And then it's like, yeah. okay, what could everybody possibly have? And then of course they have draw an emoji. So it's like, damn it. Okay. It's just it's beautifully subtle how different these things are, where you can always make an argument for why you should be correct. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it, it should give you some level of plausible deniability. We also try to work in a way to where if you think you can memorize all the prompts, um, you might the human prompt might be something like draw an electrocuted rat or something. Right. Like there's just and then maybe it's Pikachu another time. It's like it'll kind of hop around. A little oh, bit. oh, that's awesome. Okay, I didn't know it flipped like that. Uh, yeah, sometimes I've pulled alien decoys and made them an actual prompt for humans and stuff like that. Just so if someone tries to memorize the game, they'll get in trouble. So. That's so smart. <laughs> um, speaking of getting in trouble, is it no problem for you guys to reference Pikachu as long as it's just like in text form? You can just write about whatever you want. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Come at me, Pokemon company. <laughs> uh, I've never really thought about it. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah maybe uh, I'll call our lawyer right after this. <laughs> but guess what I did? <laughs> sure. Uh, how's the team feeling about Party Pack 6 overall? How do you feel like uh, this this pack kind of separates or just thematically feels different from other ones? Yeah, we're really excited about it. I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like every pack we make I don't know that we ever internally say like, oh, this is our best one yet. So much as like we're excited for something else about it. Like maybe like, cause after three, everyone would be like, this is your best one. It's like, okay, great. But we want to work on Fibbage. We love those. We love different weird games and some of them get, you know, get the love. Some don't. I feel like for six, it feels very art artistically um uh what am i trying to say just like kind of rewarding like it's got games that we think are very jackboxy 
things that have kind of been kicking around for a little bit that scratch different itches. Like I feel like we push some boundaries and it's kind of one of those things like we hope it's the best one, but then, you know, should we do another pack? We hope that's the best one. <laughs> yeah. What a non-committal answer I just gave. You, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. What uh, <laughs> is, uh, is push the button the oldest game in the pack or have some of these been kicking around for longer than push the button? I believe so. Cause TMP two, I mean, obviously it's a sequel. So, but uh, yeah, because Dictionary almost pitched this year. Role Models, Role Models, I think, may have had some DNA going last year. And then, what's our other game? Joke Boat. Joke Boat. A Joke Boat was this year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I love yeah, so I guess, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you guys deserve an award for just the name Joke Boat. It's so stupid <laughs> and so simple. It really makes me laugh. That was pitched on day one. And like I think everybody <laughs> in the office was like, that's the name of it. That's just is what it is yeah absolutely <laughs> thematically it works the art's gonna be fantastic and it's basically just you know trying to expand beyond quiplash which does everybody yeah. see quiplash as the most successful or like the go-to game yeah that's i think that's kind of the thing i feel like when someone around chicago or wherever i'm at it's kind of like oh you know what's jackbox games i'll be like well you've, you've probably seen quiplash or something like that i feel like that's the first game we'll reference yeah over you don't know jack uh, if they, well, if I think it's someone who might've been like alive during the nineties, that's one. <laughs> if it's someone who's, you know, probably 25 or younger, but you've probably played Quiplash. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What yeah. would, uh, what would surprise us about the development of the party packs? Uh, what, um, what do we expect? What do you guys spend oh, more of your man. time doing than we would anticipate? Uh, well, I'm sorry. What was that last part? What, would, what do you guys spend more time doing than we would anticipate on our end? Uh, it's play testing. Like right now there's, there's people playing, paper versions of games uh, right now that like who knows where any of our ideas go. Sometimes it's like you have 30% of an idea and like, let's just go see if anything's going to happen from this. So uh, as I walked over here, like I walked past two different game tests going on. I feel like we spend most of our year just playing some sort of idea or just trying to make a joke out of something. So uh, other than that, the only thing I think would surprise anybody I think everybody probably thinks it is like laughs and giggles all the time, right. but I would say during production, it's like, we're, we're pretty serious. So yeah, I think yeah. everybody expects it to be like a big fun house here and it is awful. It is, <laughs> it's, I'd imagine it's, too, it's a lot of people like, Hey, seriously, I am trying to program this game to get it out the door. And then people are like, come play test this idea of maybe for next year. And it's like, I don't have effing time for that. I'd imagine that's 40% of the discussions in the office. Uh, a lot of it, yeah. I feel like as as a couple of games start moving along, it's a little harder to then say get something play tested because people are busy. So it's like, and you know, we crank out five games in a year. So yeah, it's yeah, try to steal someone's time where you can. So for sure. But, and I think I just made it sound like we're at a very like buttoned up place, but we're not. But it's just I feel like when I do talk to people, it's like it must just be crazy jokes all day and it's like it's only half the day so <laughs> at some point you get <laughs> sick at one o'clock we get our crap together so. <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations on the new party pack i mean it's it's some of the most fun you can have in gaming this year so i think i mean watching oh. twitch streams for push the button i think are gonna be so much fun oh yeah i'm very excited i feel like that's a big part of our launch day uh, festivities is like sitting around watching other people stream it and see their reactions to it so judging jokes <laughs> yeah oh yeah it's like <laughs> That's what they're doing. So. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, Warren Arnold, thank you for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you very much. This is great. Absolutely. Joe Juba. Hi. I'm glad that party ended. Now we can really get down to business here. <laughs> Let's mono get serious. Mono. <laughs> this is going to be brutal. No, uh, what this is, this is strange, is for a while now, uh, I've been communicating like, hey, a lot of people write in with a lot of questions about reviews. And you're always like, ah, I'm reviews editor. I'd like to be there to answer some of those questions, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so I asked I asked you to start, uh, rather than sort of me dropping in for a question every now and then about reviews, to yeah. sort of hold back a, a stock of them, and then we can just sort of knock out a bunch of them in a dedicated segment here. Which That's right. you have been doing pretty much all year, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I went back just through 2019 alone. These are the questions that people had about Game Informers reviews and stuff like that. Uh, so we build it down to some of the very best. So if your email gets read here, uh, not eligible for email of the week, but still an <laughs> honor. And it's, it's going to be a little bit of time travel involved here because 2019 has been quite the journey. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, and it still makes the show better. That's true. So unquestionably. Mission accomplished there. Uh, but it kind of sparked from last week when, uh, you know, the discussion came up of like, oh, you should post 
on the website some of your review tips and eventually you're like let's just have it on the podcast yeah yeah let's just let's just talk about it i don't think we'll run through like a list the full list of tips or whatever but what are you serious you want to Absolutely. Well, here we go. Chuck from Gorham, Maine. Okay. okay. Uh, he says, "Hey, I've been writing comic reviews for a site called But Why Though Podcast dot com. <laughs> there we go. Congratulations okay. on the plug. Uh, for a few weeks, and my editor just sent me a preview code to review my first video game. I am both excited and nervous. Any pointers you can give a first time video game reviewer? This is a tee up, Joe, for you to hit a grand slam Man. and just run down all of your bullet points of how to write a game review. Okay, I have I have a bunch of them. Please." Uh, Let's. Can I explain some of them, or is it just rattle yes, them out? Of course. Out? Okay. <laughs> <What is this? laughs> We're trying to convey information, whichever way you best want to do that. <laughs> I'm so bound by the rules. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. So thing number one: remember that reviews are an opinion. There isn't there isn't some like objective reality of what a game is, regardless of what some meta score is going to tell you. And I don't think that huh. I don't think it serves it, the review that you're going to write. I, I, I don't think that that is made better by trying to get at some sort of objective heart of it. It's just like all you can write about is your experience with the game. It's as simple as, do you like your time playing this game yeah. or not? Do you like this game? Why, I, why or why not? Now to uh, poke a hole in thing number one. I once heard somebody in the Game Informer office years and years ago say, like, oh, I just hate this game, but I guess it's technically well-made, so I guess it'll get a decent review. Is that an incorrect way to look at things in your mind? I get, I, I, I guess I would ask what decent review means in that case. You know, cause I, I think I, it was probably 775. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. I would say that kind of game, a game that is technically functional, Mm-hmm. But, and not actively terrible, but just like not super, not super fun. Like just for a model, let's say Republic on iOS. <laughs> oh, I haven't, I didn't play that. Okay. I'm sorry. But I mean, like, I, I think a, a game that sort of falls into that space that is like generally like technically competent. Yeah. Does what it like sets out to do, but what it sets out to do isn't particularly like ambitious or fun or good that's something that scores in the like six five to seven range. how do you how do you factor that i mean what communications do you have with reviewers at game informer about when they run into situations like that where it's like it's a good game i just every time i played it i was miserable i mean i think a lot of that boils down to the text and i think Mm -hmm. that this is something that like when you talk about reviews and uh, it tends to boil down a lot to discussions of the score, yeah. which is you know a big part of reviews these days, and I understand it. But is there text with reviews? But the score does not exist in isolation, and ultimately, in my mind, like the text is the review. The text is the important part. So, as long as the text that you're writing matches up to the score that you're giving, I think, I I think that that's. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. So in the case of the game you're talking about here, if the text of the review is technically the game functions, but this boss fight, this boss fight is terrible. This is so boring. I don't care about the story. If suddenly the text of the review just weighs very negative, Mm -hmm. that's not a 775. Right. Right. So then I would approach the reviewer and say, like, I should say, I don't, like there is no dictation here in terms of what a score needs to be. Yeah. But I do demand that like the score and the text do align. Of course. So if someone writes a very negative text but gives it like a, a seven seven five, I will go to the reviewer and say, like, something needs to change here. There's there's a misalignment. So yeah. you either drop your score to match your text, or you need to reconsider the things that you're talking about in the text, like you need to emphasize some of the things you're more positive or enthusiastic about if you're absolutely set on giving it this score. Right. And I mean, people are probably curious about the entire process. So the person writes the review and then looks at their own text and comes up with the score. It's not a matter of sending the text to you and then you say, well, this reads like an 835. Right, right. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, well, how do you factor in? Uh, we're going to cover a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of questions, but I'm curious too. <laughs> yeah. What do you do when you review a game and you're just in a bad mood? You just got dumped and you have like a medium quality game. That, 
isn't it hard to have that not affect your enjoyment of an experience that's just designed to entertain you? Man, I don't know. I guess that I don't have a I don't have a like chambered response to that one. Okay. That's tricky because like I generally generally speaking, I just take a break in those in those in those times. Yeah. But I've never run into a situation where where it was like the, oh, actually. Ooh. This, oh, this is interesting. So, I'm th- I'm I guess I'm thinking about this now. I was I had finished playing but had not finished writing the review on Inaki when the layoffs happened a couple months ago yes. here. Yes. Yes. And so that's it's kind of what you're talking it's about. It's exactly that. In that like, but I mean, I had already played the game. Right. So it wasn't a question of like assessing whether or not I was I was currently having fun with it. Uh-huh. As much as as it is of like, you know, like mentally that's a tough space to be in and I just sort of like in the process of writing that, it's not like, like as I was playing the game, I did have a sense of what that game score was going to be and what the things in the review I was going to talk about. So it's not like suddenly, like I'm mentally in a you know worse place and then the worst parts emerge, right? Yes. So I just sort of, I don't know, I guess like sort of referred back to the way I was feeling before uh-huh. and like the the, the sort of, my opinions on the game during all of that stuff and just sort of tapped into that. But more. what about people that were in the middle of reviewing a game when that happened? Don't you think that affects the mood and their, and their overall enjoyment? It could. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't say definitively one, like one way or the other. I mean, that's a, I think it's, I think it's weird to, I, I, I guess that sort of plays into the, well, the one official point I've given already is like, like, a review that you write is ref- is reflective of your experience with a game. And if yeah. your experience with a game is tied into like some sort of external factors, I don't know how you like, like you just can't think your way out of that all the time. Right. And so, I, I mean, everybody's professional enough to be able to separate that. It's not like they're blaming the game for stuff yeah, that happened, exactly, but like, exactly. you know, I think it affects a mood, you know? Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I think you'll notice if you look at our site around, you know, the, like the weeks after that stuff, like we, we were not as good at hitting embargoes and stuff. I think I think we just needed some extra time and some yeah. extra space to really consider that stuff a little more carefully. Right. Yeah. Uh, a similar note. Uh, let me keep poking holes here. Co-op buddies. If you're playing a co-op game with your best friend in the world for the review, won't you have a better time with the game than if you're playing with some random schmo? Yeah. I suppose. Case in point, Dead Space 3 review from Tim Turry. Oh. <laughs> but it's true. Like, he's playing the game with his best buddy, and it's a style of game, like Resident Evil 5, that he loves so much. Yeah. He gave the game yeah. a 975. It's like, that's high. Yeah. But, I mean, that is his bread and butter. Yeah. I mean, I th- that ties into, you sort of unwittingly cracked into a, into a, into a much deeper thing there, too, though, yeah. I think. And that's like, like what... What kind of, how do you engineer the experience around playing a game for review, right? A lot of PR people would like to know. Like, I guess another question would be, how big of a fan is the reviewer of this of this particular franchise? And well, hang on, let's get right to it. Well, yeah, so that's another question that comes up somewhere in there too. Alec Johnson from Madison, Wisconsin, says Kim's. (laughs) You tell this is old. Kim's. Hot off the presses review for Kingdom Hearts 3 <laughs> made me wonder how hard it is to review a game that is part of one of your favorite franchises. Do you worry that you'll have a hard time not inflating the score a little? Personally, I would have a hard time not going easy on an installment in the Civilization or Mass Effect franchises. Yeah, and that's 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 a tricky thing. I think it goes back to the point of like ultimately all you can lean on is your experience with it. And if you get too deep in your head about, okay, well, this is me as a fan who thinks this, but what does someone who's not a fan think of this? Yeah. That gets to be a problem. And then when it comes to actually assigning, like when I assign someone on a review, yeah. there's, you, on two ends of a spectrum of thought, there are the idea that, well, you should put fans on it because they are the most acquainted with that series. They know, you know, they know what they're looking for, but then there's that danger of, uh, is it, is the score inflated at all? Then on the other end of the spectrum, are you going to put someone like, you know, 
Bert's on Zelda, who has been vocal for years about how he thinks that that's a little overrated, uh-huh. right? And then, so then are you, if you put Bert's on Zelda, are you technically getting a more like accurate or less inflated or whatever view of that? Or is that, uh, I, I guess like who, who does that review serve? Of all the people who are reading our, our review, do we, how much do we want to speak to the like, hey, I don't really like Zelda games, but here's my opinion on the on the most recent one. F you, you know, <laughs> like people who have Zelda tattoos are like, I don't want to read this crap. Yeah. yeah so of so I think ultimately, and that's that's not to say that I mean I would love to read a Zelda review by Burtz, by mm-hmm. the way, but I think I think it comes down to if if you're weighing those, if you look at it as like, as a binary situation, which it's not, but if you look at it like that. I think it's better to err on the side of going going with the enthusiasm rather than okay. rather than so that. James Smith from Scotland writes in exactly that saying how do you decide who reviews games and so the conclusion is erring on the side of enthusiasm but making sure they're not a blind zealot for this crap I think I think that's ideal yeah I mean somewhere in the middle you want someone who I think in an ideal situation you want someone who is familiar with a series history or a developer's history Mm -hmm. or a genre history and you know all of those things or maybe one of those things is enough yeah like like sometimes you don't necessarily want someone who's for everything so deep in the weeds that they can't speak to the idea of like hey i've played a lot of rpgs before should i try i don't know what persona is about should i try persona Mm -hmm. versus someone who has played and loved every persona game you yeah. Uh, sorry. So you made it through one point. Uh, it's an opinion. <laughs> Did you have more things? Well, I mean, we're, we're getting into a lot of them. I mean, yeah. like th- th- there are lots of little bits here and there. I mean, an- another, I would say another formal one is the one that we talked about uh, on the podcast last week, which is like intros or intros are really tricky. Yeah. But as a general rule, by the end of an intro, it's you want your reader to have some idea of whether or not you liked the game. I love that. And I love with uh, Chuck here, he's probably written 300 sites. Uh, he's freelancing an IGN by now. But at least when he wrote this email, <laughs> like I love getting down and into the nitty gritty with this stuff. Like stuff like, oh, the second paragraph is always lower paragraph. That's a common oh, refrain yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. How do you feel about second paragraph, lower paragraph? That's that's another one of my, uh, that's another one of my tips. Please. Don't avoid the second paragraph story dump. But is that just because We've done it so much. Like if you're no. freelancing somewhere, isn't it just a nice structure? Nope. Here's oh. here's my here's my rule against or like my reasoning behind that. It's not just avoid it because it's everywhere or whatever. It's ties into another <laughs> to another point. Please. Which is uh I this is just a weird image in my mind, and I don't know if it I don't know if it like translates as well into explanation as it does in, in the for me, but it won't. I think like when I play a game, a lot of elements, I kind of think of it as like a, almost like a scale of pros and cons. And there are certain things about the game that are heavier or lighter, more important or less important that like tip those scales in different ways. Right. So slow down, Brainiac. (laughs) I got it. No, keep going. I'm not saying it's confusing. (laughs) I'm saying it made me not, not a great image. (laughs) (laughs) So I think the best, like, I think the best reviews are ones that lead with the heaviest stuff, the hmm. most important things about a game. So let's say that you're writing a review for a Street Fighter game. Your second paragraph isn't always isn't going to be like the the tournament of champions is happening again and the world warriors gather. That's and, right. Chun Li showed up with her legs yeah. yet again. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. uh, and if, I mean. Fighting games are, I mean, obviously that's not the first thing you'd want to talk about, but I think it, I think it illustrates that point well. It's like in a fighting game, the story is a pretty light thing on that scale. Yeah. So you don't want to, you don't want to lead with that. And similarly, I think that when you're talking about, let's say, um, I don't know, like, I think for things like, let's say you're playing a first person shooter, the story and setting is going to be important, but that's not always the first thing out of the gate that you want to talk about. Maybe mm-hmm. if you're talking about a Call of Duty game, you really just want to talk about like how tight the gunplay feels and how how explosive the like cinematic moments are. 
And then maybe you then maybe that's when you start folding in some of the context around what's happening and why. Yeah. You know, like like ultimately coming out of the intro, I like it when that second paragraph is just a is a makes a big impact in terms of conveying what sets this game apart and why it's good or bad. Yeah, for sure. Um other, are there certain other tips you would give for words to avoid? Oh, man, I have okay, so many of these. There's like visceral, obviously, which is overused, but that was overused like 10 years ago, so maybe it's rebounded by now. I remember Jeff Cork prides himself in, I think it was both the cover stories and reviews for all Lego games, he refused to use the word charming, <laughs> which is a good one. Uh, other things. See, I'm not a fan of those rules, oh. like of th- things like that, because... I get that sometimes they're overused, but sometimes they're just the right damn word. Sometimes Call of Duty <laughs> is visceral. Okay, so what are your words then? Uh, it, for me, it's not avoiding specific words as much as... Um, <laughs> well, okay, it, it is avoiding specific <laughs> words, but not like that. Not, yeah. not not making a rule that like, I want to say charming, but I don't want to say charming. So it's so avoiding words like else. that? Avoiding that Avoiding. I guess stop, stop for a second. Why avoid that? What are you talking about? Generally, I like to just keep sentences sort of clean and concise. Hemingway ish. Which you wouldn't know by listening to me speak, but uh-huh. I try to write this way. That's why you've chosen uh, writing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, things. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like. Mm, the word that would come in a situation like, you know that I love you versus, you know I love you. Right. Conveys the exact same thing, but that that extra word is just doing nothing. Great. Okay. So get that out of there. Yes. Uh, Other things, I think, it's your review, your bylines on it. They know it's your opinion. Just say it. it. Great. Things like, I found myself or I managed to... You just did. Just kill it. Like, I found myself in a dungeon. I was in a dungeon. I found myself really enjoying the dungeons. Yeah, I yeah. enjoyed the dungeons. Uh-huh. Things like that. Sure. Uh, I think Uh-oh. these are the rules that these are the rules that I make for myself, and I try to enforce on other people here at GI also when I can. Do you realize you just did it there? What you said? I think these are. These are the rules. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Um, other yeah. uh, specific tips like that, just in word choice, sentence structure. Yo, know, people always talk about like dead sentence structure or something, something like that. What yeah, does that mean? If you wanna if you wanna get down to the nitty gritty of yes. it even more, please avoid starting things with like there is and there are. There are lots of power ups to get versus you get lots of power ups. Why? Or it's not. It's hard to illustrate without having a bunch of sentences in front of you. Yeah. But if you compare sentences like that, uh, the sort of dead construction version and the rewritten version, you see the trend emerge that it that it's just a more immediate and more uh, impactful sentence. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, other very specific things. Yeah. Present tense. Present tense. If if you can again, a sense of immediacy makes it makes it seem uh, I don't know, like a lot more present and exciting. So if you're talking about a a platforming game, you would want to say like, uh, "There's one boss fight where where the boss." drops barrels on you and you jump back and forth rather than in one boss fight, the boss dropped barrels on me and I jumped back and forth. And so you're writing it as if you're playing the game right now. Yeah. I mean, it's, hmm. it sort of adds, it sort of removes a lens. It removes just this layer of suddenly you're not watching the action through like imagining it happening to someone else. You're imagining it happening to you right now. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Anything else or should I go back to your questions? Let's go back to questions. Okay. Uh, Kyle Heyman in Waverly, Iowa. Um, ooh, interesting. He says, defend your review scale, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely, why is seven average on the GI review scale? I know that every study is different and it's important to be aware of the scale when looking at a review. However, I feel like this is really limiting for GI and potentially confusing for consumers. 
from the beginning of the year until I wrote this email, there are 64 reviews on the website. Who knows when this email? Yeah. Uh, with a sca- with a score of seven or above, and only 16 below a seven. There are literally fewer scores assigned available to assign to a better than average game compared to a less than average game. It seems odd that you would actively choose to have fewer ways to quantify good games. Yes, the context of the review matters. Yes, the explanation matters. But as long as you tie a score to a game, that score, apart from all the context, also matters. So how was a decision made that a seven should represent an average game? Uh, an old question. Yeah. And that's also, I mean, truthfully, that, that decision was made... Long before I even started. I think here. we talked about it in the history of Game Informer episode with, with yeah. Andy and Reiner, I think. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't speak to the origins of how that decision was ultimately made. I have been a been a steward of the system while while that's been in place, uh-huh. I guess is the do best. Do you like the system? <laughs> I do. Okay. And I think part of... I understand of, the point, though. Like, you see a lot yep. of 75775. Oh, I blah. get it. I get it. And especially if you're talking about, hey, your your scale goes from 1 to 10. Why isn't 5 average? Yeah. Like, I, I understand all those arguments. I think it helps me when I reframe the scale in my head as a standard, like, school grading scale, mm-hmm. where 70% is a C, 80% is a B, yeah. 90% is an A. Well, what do you think from uh, Adam Mistler in Raleigh, North Carolina? He says, hello, everybody. Recently, Polygon has switched to reviewing uh, without a score, and Kotaku has been doing it for a while now. Will Game Informer ever stop giving a number-based score and give a tiered recommendation? Don't play, must play, etc." I guess that ties into what I said before, too. I think, I think the text is the important part of the review for me and not yeah. the score. I still put a score on it, and I still consider, you know, like give that uh, the appropriate amount of consideration, <laughs> I think we still do it because people still want it. I love it. I love scores. I, I mean, I grew up with GameSpot. Like, I love having those scores memorized. And I think I think that's a it's a quick and easily quantifiable mm-hmm. sort of way to get an idea of what someone thinks of a game. Like, we know that Ratchet and Clank up your arsenal is a perfect ten. It hey <laughs> hey it was given a ten. It's a good game. It no was, doubt about it. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Sorry, this, is the this is this is this gripe about ten hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can and do that. And also, Paper Mario Thousand Your Door. I have some thoughts on that. Oh, I really like boy. that game. Oh boy, oh boy. Let's. Uh, I gave Metal Gear Solid Four a ten. Also, by the way, that's and, right. So. Well, look, I love that game, but come on. Yeah, <laughs> come yeah. on. Let's get realistic. Here. Um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately, I don't, I don't see the score going anywhere for yeah. for us because. I think people still like it. And yes, I, 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 agree. I I understand. I mean, nothing against the sites who have decided not to run it and to focus more on other s- sorts of discussion, but... Yeah. Yes. What do you think about the the simple don't play, must play? Basically, the don't play, rent it, buy it structure. Isn't that kind of cool? N- I want more nuance than that. Well, there's also text or words No, or but I mean, like, like e- even in terms of the score. Yeah. Like... Let's say on that scale, if something gets an eight, that's probably a, that's a play it. Yeah. Right? But then a nine five is also a play it. A nine five is like, no, you need to have that, oh my God, play it now. Okay. Well, what's a nine then? Everyone knows it's a play it. (laughs) So then. It needs to be that, you know that there are those games that burst into that next stratosphere of like Jesus Christ, like a God of War, right? Yep. yep. I mean, I, I, I guess so. So you do that. I guess mm-hmm. all I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that let's say eight and nine are both play it's. That's not a, that's not a gap in, there's no gap in their score. But for me, when I have limited time mm-hmm. to devote to something and let's say that there are two games that are roughly in the same category of things that I would like, but one's an eight and one's a nine. Sure. I'm probably going to be more interested in the, in the higher scoring one. All of course, right. this is where you actually do research and actually read reviews and don't just look at scores. Right. You look at Metascores. But, yeah, okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> do you like Metacritic? <laughs> uh, it is uh, a helpful tool, is it not? Yeah. I... I, I think Metacritic is a helpful tool for consumers that has been weaponized against game developers a little yeah. bit, and I don't like that part of it. Right. Uh, Nick Anguiano from San Diego, California. 
He says, <laughs> oh, this is current. Anthem has got me thinking uh, <laughs> of the actual usefulness of a review of a game as a service. Take Rainbow Six Siege, for example. It launched to mediocre reviews. Burt's gave it a seven, but it is now one of the most popular online shooters out there because that game is dramatically different than how it was at launch. I would argue that if Burt's were to review that game today, probably at IGN or whatever, <laughs> uh, he would probably Aww. score it uh, higher than a seven. Are reviews for games as a service even useful? Has this conversation ever come up at GI? <laughs> <laughs> this is a crusade. Uh, yeah. I think, to, a- to an- answer the explicit question, I think reviews for games as service are useful for when the game comes out. Mm-hmm. In the same way that when any game comes out, there are going to be people who are curious about it and reading reviews and wanting to know the state of it, right? That's why we print all the games of service reviews in the magazine on Disappearing Ink, which I think <laughs> is very helpful. <laughs> but I completely acknowledge the issue there of, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, in my own personal experience, a game like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I gave an 825 when it came out. And if you look at that game a year later, like I think it's substantially better. Even Unity. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Unity's another is, is a whole different beast. Mm-hmm. So like, the those are cases where going back to those reviews six months, a year later, I I know that they're not representative anymore. And you know, we that's a conversation that we've been having here for years at this point in terms of how we <laughs> someday we should do something about how this. we adapt to that. And yeah. you know, like you know, we've we've. Yeah, I, I guess that's all I can say about it at the right, moment, other than, course. like, of course we're aware of it, and those conversations are happening, and we would, you know, we would like to would like to address that in the best way we can. There we go. Uh, just, uh, bleh, Jason from West St. Paul uh, wants to know what difficulty people review games on. And do you coach anybody for, like, just uh, play it on normal, you idiot? <laughs> I think normally it's normal. Yes. I think when we review a game, the purpose... Well, not the purpose, but the the experience that we should try to evaluate is is sort of the the baseline one that the developer tuned for just normal players coming into it. Yeah. Uh, Thomas from Laguna Hills, California says, reviewing games, uh, when you're reviewing games, do you ever worry that your scores, though fair, might keep people from discovering titles that might speak to them despite their flaws? I think I think that's where the text comes in again too. You're right. Something Read the like, text. like the, and this is another one for me that I've caught some flack for. But I gave Near Automata a seven seven five. That's right. <laughs> which, if you just look at that score, you think, well, that's a average, just slightly above average game. But if you like in the text, it's. I still think it does a good job balancing the positive and the negative. Uh huh. But I really try to convey, like, this is a game that when it's firing, it really does a lot of cool and interesting things that I highly recommend you experience if you're into this kind of stuff. Right, right. But that doesn't make, that doesn't necessarily offset all of the stuff that I had problems with. But it's really worth checking out for these things for these people. Right. Like you said, the soundtrack was too good. I remember you dinged it for that. Yeah, Um, yeah, exactly. uh, exactly. Alex Hanavan says, hey, Ben and company, uh, whatever happened to Second Opinions? Yeah. It's a Game Informer thing where we had multiple people review games back in the day. Yeah. The very short answer to that is we don't have the time for them anymore. Uh Uh-huh. And they just were too similar all the time. Yeah. And we are not... I think it was Matt Helgeson who came up with this phrasing for it years ago and I really, I really liked it because it completely captures the approach for me is we're not going to manufacture dissent. Right. I don't like, I'm not going to put someone on a review to be, to say, Hey, you be devil's advocate on this because then that's not their opinion. That's just them manufacturing some sort of argument that runs counter to the main review. Right. And maybe that'd be fun in video form, but written. Eh, yeah. And on. also, I mean, but I mean, mainly we just don't have the time for that. Who's, right. who's going to, to have two people play the same game through these days is... Exactly. The office is bustling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke Chambers from Indiana says, how often do you read other people's reviews of a game after you've written a review of it? Or do you, re- do you generally avoid reading other people's reviews? I always avoid reading other people's reviews before I write mine. Yeah. Um, what, what about like, you know, you're on Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. Laying out that heat, dishing some gossip. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what if you see people just pop up in your timeline of like, oh my God, this game is the second coming of Christ. Isn't that a factor? See, for me, it has less to do 
with knowing whether or not other people are liking the game as much as it is like as much as it is the specific things that they talk about and the ways that they talk about them. Mm -hmm. So remember, I think it was last year, there was that, there was that plagiarism thing going on with dead cells, right? Oh yeah. Remember that? That was fun. Like that was obviously plagiarism, Mm -hmm. but it also made me nervous because how often do you read something or hear something and then just subconsciously, you know, like you hear 100%. someone use a word and then later that day you use the same word. Absolutely. That you never use, but mm-hmm. someone used it before. It's like just skimming the surface of your brain, right? There are unconscious ways that that kind of stuff and those, those kinds of phrases can surface. And I just don't want to deal with any of that. Right. So... That's what I'm more worried about rather than getting my like opinion tainted by, I mean, I'm, you know, not, not that I'm some legendary figure here, but like I'm pretty confident in my ability to like or not like a game regardless of whether or not other people like or don't like it. What mm-hmm. I worry about is the way I articulate it and I don't want to, and I don't want to like unwittingly take that from anyone else. Right, right. So... And I instruct uh, other GI editors to also not read uh, other people's reviews before they publish them. You actually over an unplugged Ethernet cable from the computer at work, which is pretty drastic. But after it goes up, I I love reading other people's reviews. Oh, really? You like reading reviews? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you edit other sites in your mind? No. No. Really? Mm Mm-mm. That seems Oh, I mean, I guess that's not totally true. There are times when I like read an intro and I'm just like, ugh, no, that one doesn't work for me. Uh But I don't like, I don't. I'm not getting paid to edit other people's reviews. I don't do that. Here's a real question. Um, you know, after the layoffs here at Game Informer, several editors have written for other sites. Mm, yeah. Have you read their reviews and do you notice like, oh, I would have edited this or they're writing differently because they're for another no, site now? No, a good example is that Kyle also reviewed Indivisible. Yeah. Um, and uh, I I read his review and, and liked it. And he actually, like, he and I agreed independently on a lot of, on a lot of points on that uh-huh. game, I think. Um, the main thing about that is it just made me a little sad. Because, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, like I think, you know, when, when you, when you lose what's well, a seven editors, like we did, I think that th- you're losing a different perspectives and different voices that, that we'd otherwise have. So yeah, I, I missed reading Kyle's thing. That made me sad more than anything else. Yeah. You don't miss just tearing his reviews to shreds? No. Okay. Uh, Eddie writes in, says, hope the day finds you well. Well, you know. Uh, I'm Eddie from Tustin, California. Do you ever find yourself having to dig your heels in when it comes to other reviewers at GI? Would love some insight into how the scoring process works. Yeah, how often uh, is there a big argument about reviews, review scores? Yeah, I think that I think that tens are really the most contentious ones. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, there's no there's no demand that a certain game needs to score a certain way. Yeah. So there's no digging digging heels in in the sense that a reviewer wants to give it a, a nine, but everyone else is saying you have to give this game an eight. Yeah. I think where the digging heels comes in is uh, after the fact when, like, let's say you give a 10, no one's ever coming, like, I guess the better way to describe it is, let's say that I give something uh, a nine. Someone else would come in and be like, hey, I played that game. I really liked it. No, it was pretty good. I, don't know, I mean, I'd give maybe like an eight five, but no, I mean, we're, we're about in the right area. You know, like that's seen as general agreement. But if I give some, something a 10 and someone else comes in, that 0.5 difference, if they say, oh, I'd give it a 9.5. Right. That, does, that is not seen as general agreement. That's seen as like... You blew it. Like, I would not have given that a 10, and let yes. me tell you why. Yes, exactly. Uh, but, you know, I mean, we're all... I feel like we're all pretty secure in our opinions here. We're kind of like throwing them around at each other, so... I yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the last time it was a big blow. It's like, it's pretty soft. It's like Jeff Cork, like, I really like Link's Awakening. It was like, ah, oh, the review score isn't matching the text. Oh, let's try and get that more in line. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Robert Medina. Ooh, there's a current one. Ooh, the big blowouts do come in the end of the year discussions, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway. That's fun for the community to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> So Robert writes in says, <laughs> <laughs> fun for everybody. Uh, with the Blizzard backlash after the China remark, uh, it had me thinking. 
Are video game journalists ever afraid to say an honest opinion on a game knowing the publisher could deny them early copies for review? Is GI afraid to say anything bad for cover trips? I know you can't give me a real response to not offend China's or GameStop's <laughs> feelings. Thank you. Uh, just kidding. How about this sticky wicket, Joe? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I, I can understand where that question comes from. <laughs> uh-huh. I think I can say that we don't consider that mm-hmm. but i think that it, like i i can only speak for our for our outlet right and i think that we have i think we work with some great folks like some great pr people out there who just understand the way the way this works that it's mm-hmm. nothing personal if the game that you're representing doesn't score well from us that's just that that that's that's just the way this business works and everyone that i've worked with generally seems to have a good understanding about that do you feel like it's gotten better over the years because maybe people that are getting into the pr scene they grew up as fans of video game websites and like they understand it maybe a little bit better than they did 15 years ago or so whenever you started i don't know i mean it seems like it seems pretty consistent for me yeah like it is it has never been for no game that i've reviewed has it ever been a concern that like oh is this somehow going to be like sabotaging a relationship? That yeah. kind of thinking I think has been like, since I started, was pretty actively discouraged. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I guess, I think we also have the luxury of being who we are and that people will come, will come to us with reviews and with, you know, cover opportunities and stuff. I guess I, not having ever worked at a smaller outlet, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a if that would be a concern for someone else. But right, right. It hasn't been for us. What about uh, cover story trips influencing a reviewer's opinion at all? Like when you spend two days in a studio and you kind of soak in that world, like I'm playing Outer Worlds right now, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, I know so much the lore and the backstory of this world because I spent two days talking to the developers. And now I'm playing the game. And it's like, I wonder what my perception would be of this world if I didn't have that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd, I don't know for sure how, to, how that would do it or like how that might influence it. Mm-hmm. I guess it boils down to partially what I was talking about before in that I would rather err on the side of knowledge and enthusiasm. Right. So if... If there's someone on staff who has like been on a cover story trip for a game, but they are also, they probably went on that cover story trip because they were particularly suited to write about that game. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I guess I, I, I can't say for sure that it, that it wouldn't have some sort of, some sort of influence on it, but I guess I, I again, I guess I would rather err on that side than be like, well, let's get the local idiot to review this one. Exactly. Though yeah. I, I will say too, though, um, that I leave an open door for reviewers to recuse themselves if they feel like they are too close to a particular game. So yeah. sometimes there are times when people will go, will, um, so like this happened with me and Final Fantasy 15, oh, for sure. instance. You know, it's like, because we spent more than just a couple days. It's like a week at We at spent Square, like yeah. a week at Square Enix. And not only that, but like they showed us so much of the game, even off the record stuff that we like couldn't print in the story. Yeah. But like at that point, I felt like so... That and there was were, stuff like enemies, like, oh, there, this is an there were major thing. There were major story points that yeah. were spoiled for me on that trip to the point that I felt like... I or Kim, who was also on the trip, wouldn't really be able to like review that game properly because there just there would be a sense of like wonder and surprise that would just be totally gone from it. Yeah, you know. So people can come to me and say like, I just feel like I know too much or I'm too close to these particular developers or whatever, and then then we find someone else for it. Yeah, but in in cases where that's possible, I will always go and like talk to the person about it first too to, to make sure that they're comfortable tackling a review like that yeah okay don't use the word that um, reviews are opinions don't start sentences with there is there are uh-huh. present tense yep um, let's see the weighing thing Weigh the weighing thing heavy, heavy stuff second first second paragraph uh, should be the meatiest thing there yep um, what else are we missing the big one that we're missing I think that's really important is is assess and don't explain don't be an instruction manual 
Interesting. Don't tell me what, what the weapons are. Don't tell me what moves you have. Tell me the impact they had on your game. Tell me why you like those things. And that's a common trap is, oh, you now here, here's how the multiplayer system works. Very common. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like to, and it's all about finding a balance because you do need some of that mechanical stuff in there. You need to convey for someone to understand why combat is cool or why story is cool. You need to convey something about the structure around those things. Yeah. But you don't want to just turn into yeah, turn into the instruction manual that says these are all the moves at your disposal. Because mm-hmm. that's, inter- that's not interesting to read about. It's best if that information comes out in the form of different examples, right? Like, I really liked the combat system. The enemies force you to use everything at your disposal from sword swipes and fire magic to mounts and harpoons or yeah. whatever, you know? So you give a sense of the variety and how things work, but then you're also talking about some aspect of the game, in this case, like the strategic variety of it that you liked. This is the thing the game does that sets it apart. Yeah. Um, do you have in your mind, like, the best review you've ever written? Oh, boy. <laughs> we can put the link to Quiet Man in the show notes. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, don't, I don't hold that up in my mind, really. I don't. But you definitely... Do you have a feeling, as somebody who's never written a review... Of that, like, this is a good review that I've written yeah. versus this is kind of technically a review. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I have a sense, like, I guess I'd say one of the reviews that came easiest to me and felt the most natural to write was The Witness. Oh, weird. I just started replaying that. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was one. Normally, a review will take me a full day or more to write. And The uh-huh. Witness, just writing that review just took me a couple hours. So you just connected the dots easily in your mind. Exactly. Okay. And yeah, yeah, it was just following that grid right through. So you think if people want your example of what you think a good review is, <laughs> check out your review for The Witness? I haven't reread it in a long time. Maybe okay. it's not that good. But, okay. but right. th- that, that was one that at least as I was writing it was like this, it felt like it was clicking together pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so. Is there a favorite editor that you like to read the reviews or edit the work? Uh, Not that everybody else is trash, but number one in your mind, who do you think is the strongest? I, Come mm, on, no, you coward. No, Come I'm on. Not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick any favorites. I can say it like cause it's the truth is is that there's different things about every okay. person that I that I like reading. And that's not just a cop out. I mean, like that's sure. That's really that's really the truth. You go like What do you like about Jeff Quirk's writing? Jeff in particular has a I think has a good strength has a strength in separating the things that are important versus not important to talk about and then finding, finding a like interesting ways to, to frame those things. So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a bunch of bullet points that he's going through. It feels like these are the most important things and it's just sort of a natural like flow from one to the other. Hmm. So Jeff Cork's the best. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) If, if 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 you if you're gonna put those words in my mouth, <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. Any other pointers? I, th- I think we went through all of them. The, I guess the final final one, uh-huh, as Columbo would say, is that none of the none of the rules are always applicable all the time. Oh, Christ, you can't do that. So what's important about them? I think I think it's important to follow them, which I try to do. But it's yeah. also important to know when you need to break them. Right. Follow them first and know why you're doing that. Yes. And be aware when you're sort of like veering outside the lines and have a good reason for doing that. Right. But don't, don't, if there's a sentence that really conveys what you're going for correctly, don't delete it just because it starts with there is. Yes. Like so, sometimes you need to do that. Right. You make, you make those calls. Yeah. Yeah. But don't make those calls all the time because then it just feels like sloppy writing. That's true. Uh, Alex, intern in the booth, how would you review this discussion? Um, number in your mind. Hang on. He's giving it a nine. All wow. right. All Buy right. it. <laughs> Buy it today. <laughs> Must play. <laughs> oh, wait, no, it's not that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not good. Nuts. Okay, uh, let's move on to real emails now. And welcome back to the Informer Show. We have Brian Che returning. Uh huh. And we have Kimberly Wallace returning. Hey, hey. And who is this? Mr. Death Stranding himself, Matthew Cotto. <laughs> hey, hey. 
Can't can't say anything about that. Can you say whether you have played Death Stranding? Uh, yes, I have it in my possession. I saw it at your desk as I walked by, and I don't want to know a thing. Even if you could say something, which you will, you are legally not allowed to even whisper That's one true. word about it beyond the fact that you are in fact playing it. Yeah, and the more that you talk, the more you're in the umbrella of the uh, NDA as well. So just to oh, let no. you know, yeah. Okay, I'll stop asking questions about right. it. <laughs> but, okay. You've got you, your eye you on can't, me, it looks You can't like. ask anything. I'm not going to, but just people watching the video version, they can look at Kato's face. He's been playing Death Stranding all day. Does he look happy? Does he look sad? Does he look disappointed? Does he look overjoyed? Many moods. Many moods! Many moods. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, this is the email section, Kimberly Wallace. You look horrified by that face study, by the way. <laughs> I don't know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> People wrote into podcastgameformer.com uh, with questions, words of wisdom, feedback, dares, trivia, uh, everything under the sun. Dares, you, like you said, there we go. That's why I was nervous. Uh, anything that makes the show better. People sent it into podcastgameformer.com. We're going to choose some of our favorites, choose our absolute number one favorite, tippy top favorite, and then put a pin in the big board where that person is from, by Brian Shea. What do you think about that? love it <laughs> wow we don't really get a lot of stuff from the midwest do we uh you know it's a strangely it's, northeastern yeah, yeah. united states dominated thing we have one in minnesota uh which is impressive mostly the coastal elites though yeah, yeah this I'm podcast saying, like, isn't supposed to be map for them. Is completely <laughs> empty, like, come on empty let's step up everybody States, so. okay here we go first question oh look at this 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 fits the bill. This is Jack from Pretoria, South Africa. Mm, right. That's the middle of the country if I have ever known one. We would have a first pin. That's true. In that continent. He says, hey, Ted Danson. This is very funny. Oh. Um, I don't think about that enough. Uh, he says, last week I was playing Borderlands 3 and got myself stuck at the boss with the anointed Goliath at the Jacobs estate, unable to beat it no matter how hard I tried. The following day at work, I was thinking about ways to beat this thing, thinking of different loadouts or special abilities combos, only to get home that evening to find that Gearbox had patched the game and removed a quarter of the anointed Goliath's health. I then beat it first try. However, I didn't feel like I earned that victory. In the old days, if you were stuck in a boss fight, you were just stuck, and that was it. Can the calloused gaming veterans at Game Informer comment on the softness of games in the modern day? I don't think that sounds like softness. That's obviously a uh, gearbox, you know, sort of problem. I think because I think back in the day you would have just, I don't know, you would shrug your shoulders and oh, just yeah, this is unbalanced. Gone on with your life. Yeah, I mean, I would say though that is annoying that more and more it seems like the question comes up: Do these people play their own games? Mm -hmm. And I think unfortunately we're finding more and more the answer is no. I mean, that sounds kind of why harsh, do you say that? But, I mean, something like it's that. It's like something stuff you would catch if you just played. Particularly a but I mean, playtesting in the office but, but particularly a world. boss battle, though. I mean, that is, you know, that's a choke point. That's a point that everybody's going to have to go through. It's not like it's some random corner of some room where you go and you jump four times yeah. and you happen to fall through the environment. I mean, that's just like, you know. And plus, besides, that's probably, that should be a value somewhere on a sheet, right? Uh, on like a dev sheet as they're going through it, mm -hmm. they would know what, you know, uh, what the hit points or whatever for that boss is. So that should be something that's, I could be wrong, but not even a, a playtesting issue. Well, yeah, maybe they do the playtest and they're like, you know, yeah, we know it's hard, but, you know, Dark Souls is popular. What are you going to do? And then they get it out to the mass audience and they can actually look at the analytics and see, oh, there are a significant number of people here uh, like uh, Jack that are going to work the next day and thinking about this boss fight without yeah. beating them. But and I mean, but Jack, you know, in deference to Jack, it sounds like <laughs> he had a particular, I mean, not even just like, oh, this is hard and, yeah. you know, maybe I should like, I mean, he's obviously a very thoughtful person. He was thinking That's of right. loadouts and all kinds of stuff, strategies. Yeah. This just sounds like a hard... Like well, I yeah. said, that doesn't sound like difficulty to me. That sounds like the other is a cheap <laughs> <laughs> right. boss. Like, and they realized it because you don't just, a lot of times developers don't just shave off health unless there's a serious problem. Right. Going they realized, oh, so, we went overboard with this guy. And I am all for, things. I love those challenging boss battles that when you finally beat them, you just, I mean, Monster Hunter gives me that feeling. Um, so many times when I played, and there's just a really, really hard one that, Ooh. like. At a certain point, though, it's like, you're not even satisfied when you beat it, especially if you have to like resort to like cheesing the same move over and over again, or well, like you, finding well, some crappy me, tactic. Like I try to like play my strategy better, try different things. I didn't. I, I like that challenge, but I don't like it when it's just like this is cheap. This isn't even fun. Yeah, but I do like those moments when you did. You were like, I beat that finally, and it just you. You have that like scream of yes, it's it's the best part. Well, here's something for you then. This is Jason Wojnar. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Wojnar. Uh, from the Ukraine. 
You heard about this place, Kato? <laughs> uh, so Jason says, I was playing Dark Souls 2 recently, and I lost 100,000 souls while literally several steps away from getting them back. <laughs> My roommates were in the house, so I couldn't make any noise or show how upset I was without freaking them out. They're not uh, gamers either, so they wouldn't understand. Keeping that frustration inside probably took years off my <laughs> life. <laughs> Can you all make your most sincere reactions to dying and getting really upset at a video game? <sighs> this is sincerely... Is that what it sounds like, Shay? No, it's usually... I'm, I'm not gonna... I mean, I thro I've thrown my controller down a few times. But sincerely, imagine like your most frustrated moment at Monster Hunter Iceborne and go. Oh, God, I don't even know. I had one the other night where I just started like with NHL where it was like cheap ketchup AI. <laughs> and I was like, so mad. And I'm like, Son of Oh my god. I, uh, was it really that? It was. It was like uh like, That's your go to or this I go, that's bull that's that's usually the one I go to and it's like yeah. this annoyed like that is total bullshit. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, really I've already well. cursed once on the podcast. No, that's so, fine. Uh, I curse every the time. The point I'm is to curse. Too. Yeah, it's is it's th it's cursing. Is this Zach's <laughs> brother? I don't know. I was wondering that too. I think it is. I, I think, think I, I had do. a casual conversation with him and he mentioned that his brother was in the Ukraine. Oh, really? This is awesome. Oh, wow. There oh, it is. Thanks yeah. for writing in, Jason. Uh, for me, yeah. If I'm really frustrated, it's just, I'll probably just go, Yeah. Just something like that. Just one good, quick outburst. And I know it was bleeped, but uh, <laughs> I said, I said my mother's name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hanson. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Okay, Daniel from Toronto, Canada says, I wrote in last week about Halloween costumes and Ben mispronouncing the names of Canadian cities. You asked me if you got the pronunciation of the Canadian city correct, and drumroll, you failed. Okay, also, Matt that's Miller what I failed. Was it is pronounced Mississauga, but at least what did you tried. You think it was? Mississauga or oh. something. Mm. Mississauga. Okay. It's pronounced Toronto. Toronto. Got it. Like Wazetta? Ugh, don't get us started on YZ. <laughs> you know what you did, YZ. I, have um, a, I actually have a funny story about, like, in general, my biggest fear on this podcast and what gets me most anxious is, like, mispronouncing something. And I'll think, oh. I'll think about it because I'll even, like, start to talk and I will pause because, like, in my mind, I am going to say this wrong. What's the name? How do you say it? Like, it just... it. And It'll I'm freak, sure yeah. people are just like, oh, she just mispronounced, whatever. But like for me, it's like, it's terrifying. Well, it's especially like the last couple of weeks. I think I said the word vague a bunch mm -hmm. and people were like, why is he saying vague so weird? It's like, I think it's a Minnesota thing. It's like big. Like you, What's like Minnesotans say bag weird as well. It's bag. Yeah. yeah. Bag. Yeah. Bag. 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 It's the same thing, right? You're I, saying it I have, the way normal people say it. We all have those words. Like, no, no, no. I, I don't I like to so. say the ru the word ruin because I have always said it like rune. Like, mm. And so I didn't realize that was kind of like a Midwest Chicago thing until oh, I weird. came here. Route or yeah. root? Route. I guess route. Depends on the context, route I think. 66, <laughs> route 66, though. Route 66 or saying it like route, that, route canal. But route, Dr usually. Yeah, route canal, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, Lucas Adams wants to know, hey, I have a simple question. Why are there no video game musicals? I don't mean musical games like Rock Band, but literally a video game story that's presented in a song and dance musical format. My prediction, that within the next 10 years, there will be a hit video game musical. Like something that is performed in a theater about video games? On Broadway. There's going to be, like, what would the IP be? Well, there's already the Pokemon musical. There's, I, that's, yeah. This is why I wanted to bring this up, because yeah. this reminds me of, we did a whole special episode of the podcast about the Pokemon musical and what a <laughs> show it was, <laughs> and how it like implies that Giovanni is Ash's dad and a bunch of just nonsense. You can go back and find that one in the archives. It's fun. Um, but what IP do you think would make it? Oh, man. Metal Gear is the obvious one that Kyle Hilliard <laughs> would always bring up, <laughs> which I do think Metal Gear would be an awesome oh, musical. Man. I mean, you could have the, you know... A big sort of uh, a romantic, sweeping, uh, melodramatic, like Castlevania, you know. Oh, yeah, but that's about vampires and dumb stuff. Well, exactly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you I mean, do a Final Fantasy musical. Yeah, which I, would, I, would, I know, that's it. But I just love to see spiky hair people <laughs> up on stage. Ooh, how would you do the opera stuff? scene yeah. in an actual opera house? Ooh. Well, that's what I'm saying. You could do it uh, based on one game, or you could just, like, Create a story within the Final Fantasy universe for the musical. Oh, using, like spirits like, within. Song. Yeah, <laughs> right. That worked out so well. Uh, but I mean, the go-to would within. just be like Mario, right? Like they're oh, like, course. hey, we want to adapt a popular thing. That's probably what they would Oof. do because little kids would want to go see that, and they'd make bang. Or Pokemon, like do like the like a do game. a good yeah. version of yeah. Pokemon. <laughs> it, it is insane that they have not. It'd given probably that be a, a Nintendo property, if I'm thinking. Yeah, but just about. writing lyrics to the Mario theme. Can you imagine what a disaster that would be? Oh yeah. Well, they already <laughs> tried that with the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Oh, 
Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, the end credit scenes. I don't even like it when they put the lyrics version for the new Smash theme because like I don't oh, like yeah. thing that in the kingdom. Colors fall for the love. Yeah, it's like I don't want to think about that when I'm listening to that awesome song. Um, Colin from Woodridge, New Jersey says, "Hey crew, what does it take for you to justify buying a new replacement controller?" Does it have to be absolutely destroyed or slightly sticky analog sticks, the final straw? So I actually go through a lot of controllers and people always are like, how do you go? Like, cause I was complaining like next gen, I hope I don't have to buy so many PS4 controllers uh, because I play sports games and it's just mm-hmm. like use a lot of the sticks that go back and forth. Yeah. So when it just doesn't feel right anymore and I, I j- that's when I get a new one. But what do you do with the old ones? You just have like a drawer filled with I, like I will use dish. those to play games that are not sports because it doesn't okay. matter as much. So yeah, I have them sitting around, but like I freaking, I'm so tired of buying new controls and like my fiance always jokes like you're just too rough on all of them because I had br- broke a bunch of 360 ones too just because it's from doing the damn face offs and maybe if I didn't spend yeah. 500 hours on NHL a year it uh-huh. would be a different story. Yeah, EA should like they should bundle a controller for free with every copy of any sports I'm at game. The, I'm actually at the point right now where I need a new one and I've been trying to be stubborn about it because I'm like this is where I say no mm. more. Just, have, I'm going to deal with it. I have so many Xbox One controllers really? because I bought two at launch. And then they didn't have the headphone jack because I remember you had to wear that. You had to put that stupid adapter in the bottom of it. So I bought another one then. Then I got an Xbox One X, so I got another one then. Oh, no. And so it's like, yeah, I've just been collecting. And then PS4, I have three of them because I got two of them at launch. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the sticks broke, and then I got a PS4 Pro, and that yeah. came with another one. So I will need the analog stick to start shredding. But even then, I played with a PS4 controller much longer than I should have until finally I was like, I'm done with this. And it was so satisfying to go and get a new PS4 controller because I hadn't had a new one since launch. And so like even just the new design where it's like, oh, it has the light bar and the touchpad and stuff. Like I still hadn't felt that new version of the PS4 controller. It's like, it goes back to the reason that I got the PS4 Pro and I wanted the Xbox One X is that like this is something that I spend so much time with between my job and like my number one hobby. It's like, mm-hmm. I want to have the best possible experience. So if like the controller even gets a little crappy, I'm going to probably replace it. Yeah. Do it, dude. I did. Uh, Kato, you play a lot of sports games. You beat the crap out of them too. Yeah. I actually tried to uh, clean out two, two different, well, one, I started on one trying to clean it out. And of course, just opening it up, just, it developed a whole nother problem. Uh, so I had this other one. I tried to do that one and did the same thing. So then I just, yeah. Down Some sports games. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, Nate from Toledo says, hey, everybody, I've been catching up on the podcast. And in one episode, I don't remember which one. Sorry. He says, you guys talked about final boss battles that have different mechanics than the rest of the game. Ugh, oh, hate it. Well, after catching up, nobody wrote in to say that Uncharted 4's final boss using, using Un- uses the fencing mechanics. Uncharted does not have oh. good final boss fights traditionally. It's a t- Tough series to have a final boss. I man. love those games for the most part, but like, yeah, yeah those final boss battle, mm-hmm. battles are always just like, uh, I guess we have to plow through this one. Yeah, and Nate brings up the point that it's true that originally there was going to be kind of like a tutorial for that in one of the flashback sequences about oh. how to fence, and then they ended up cutting that. So now <laughs> it just really feels like out of the blue, we're fencing. Okay. It's, it's, it's still a cool fight, though. I like that fight. Yeah. Um, it's better see. than the other ones, I think. Okay. I don't even, what is Uncharted 2's final boss? I don't remember. Uh, you were running around in that like jungle area with all yeah. like those like Superman pods that were bursting and stuff, and the guy had like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Hang on, is Uncharted kind of dumb? It really sucked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brandon from Rosamond, California says, hey everybody, um, so with Last of Us 2 getting a release date, it got me wondering, what does Naughty Dog do after that? Seeing as there is no more Nathan Drake, do they continue with Lost Legacy? or go dark until perhaps a sequel to The Last of Us, or even a new IP. I know it sounds out of left field, but I could see a sci-fi space game coming from them. New uh, IP. New IP. They new definitely yeah. are due for new IP. Yeah. yeah. It seems like perfect like timing for them. Yeah, because I remember it was it was so strange on that Lost Legacy cover story trip around Kim. I remember it wasn't until like day two that it was just like, yeah, what the... F-? So we're like asking Evan Wells, the president, just, yeah. what is Lost Legacy? Is this a one-off? Is this yeah, a model for the just, future? Yeah. Like, what is this thing you're making? And the answer was like, Oh, it's just a thing. They made it sound like they were like, we're we're pretty much we're done working with Nathan Drake in a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? They it just seemed like they wanted to do other things, and I do think like Lost Legacy was that 
well, let's, because uh, I thought maybe that was like their, let's see if we had like an, somebody else lead a game, if that would be possible to continue the series. And then Which when I asked him is. that, he's like, no, nah, we're not really doing it, like trying it for that reason. And I was like, okay. Well, <laughs> and what, now in retrospect, it's this? even more confusing. Yeah, but I'm it's like, still, can you, do you remember they turned that game around in a year? It's yeah. just absurd. That is a studio that's known to crunch, but I bet that must be just one of the most challenging year spans in mm-hmm. the studio's mm-hmm. recent life, at least. Although I'm sure everyone's having a blast over there making <laughs> Last of Us Part 2. The game was good, though. Yeah. Real good. Yep. Um, yeah, I bet it's going to be Last of Us Part 2 releasing in, what, February? Is that right? Yeah. And then they'll work on the PS5 version, which includes multiplayer, re-release that. Mm-hmm. But then while that team's working on the multiplayer edition, then the incubation will continue yeah. probably for a new IP. And there's been rumors for a long time they're working on sci-fi stuff. and yeah. I don't know mm-hmm. nothing about it. But. You know, and if you're Sony and you're looking at, uh, you know, the PS5 era and beyond, yeah. what better way to have a new IP to anchor yourself on yep. if, you know, because otherwise you're yeah. just losing I- iconography or whatever of the past generation in some way. Yeah, I would sure. guess they've already started talking about that. What they're Oh, yeah. No, I bet they're already yeah. working on it. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, some, <laughs> they're trapped in a room somewhere, but they're, they're working on it. Yeah. And I guess sci-fi, like in terms of Sony's library, it could... Yeah, Ratchet and Clank is kind of sci-fi if they want to go back to that. Or well, a lot of their serious sci-fi have games have just fallen through, really. Like, right. like, they haven't hit the way people thought they were going. Just like, all right, this is going to be the Halo killer. And, then, and it's like Horizon sci-fi, I guess. But come on, what are we talking yeah. about here? Yeah. It's like robot dinosaurs, but no one... I don't know. Like, just a good... Yeah, it doesn't feel... They need, like, interstellar yeah, style Yeah, they like, sci-fi. flying yeah. through space, shooting aliens. Right. Yeah. But then do you even try that? I mean, obviously it'd be a drastically different game, but... Starfield from Bethesda is probably going to be huge. Mm -hmm. They would probably, that I'm sure would release before Naughty Dog's game. So it's like, I know it'd be open world versus probably more narrative approach, but who knows? Good luck, Naughty Dog. (laughs) Have fun out there. Um, (laughs) Joe from London, UK says, hello, Ben, Ben, Leo, and Dan. Well, Nice guess. This, I don't think this uh, squad's ever been on the podcast together. No. Can you think of any other time? This is, this is interesting. Uh, I'm sure it's happened. Nope. I bet, it, I bet it's, it's never not. happened. No. I would, I would go. bet a million dollars on it. Um, <laughs> Joe says, hey, and if you find out that I'm wrong, I will send you $1 million, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Doll hairs. <laughs> Anyways, Joe from London says, hey, the comment from Blue Point Games in the PS5 article you discussed last week got me thinking. The idea of their next game not quite being a remake, but more of a reimagining, and quotes in the Wired article saying that it's a big one, I'll let you figure out the rest, made me wonder. Could Blue Point Games be, a lot of people think it's going to be Demon Souls, could it be Shadow of the Colossus 2? They bring up like all the cut Colossi that were originally mapped hmm. out and stuff for that original game. Like, I, I think there's a chance. It sounds sacrilegious, but they've already remade it. Like, they have those assets. It's not insane at this point. I don't know. You got to think the numbers for that thing have gone steadily down. You know, no offense to it or whatever. I know it's a classic game. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's seen as is, is that cult classic status. But I think the more you milk it, the more you go back. I don't think it's seen it as a property that, you know, as of the last time has like got an on, on I the I think the PS4 surge. version. I don't know if they released any numbers, but I think it sold all right. I love the PS4 impression. version. Yeah. Uh, finally played the way it should have on PS2. Right. Well, um, I think they did that with the PS3 version, basically. When they yeah, that's the true. Rate. But would you be upset if you could choose for them to make a <sighs> Shadow of the Colossus 2 or something else? Would you make Shadow of the Colossus 2? It would feel weird not having the original yeah. team on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't so know. So no? Everybody would vote no. I would not it. want them to be in charge. Like, I, they can help out with it. Like, they, they obviously yeah. did a great yeah. job, but, like, they weren't the ones who designed Shadow of the Colossus 1. So, right. like, they, they obviously handled the tech stuff, but, like... Yeah, it would be weird having them like create an all new game. Now this is on that uh, the silly hour. But what if Naughty Dog said we're making <laughs> we're making Shadow of the Colossus two? Would oh you say yes God. then? I don't think I would. Oh really? I, would, I yeah. don't think they feel like a good fit for that. No, I mean it would be like if Naughty Dog was like, "Hey, we're making the next Legend of Zelda mainline game." A game it would be like people want it. It'd be people like that. Want that would still be bound weird. by so, yeah. So it would be weird, decisions. you know? Yeah, yeah. But I just imagine like the dramatic speech from Dorman and Shadow of the Colossus. You'd have the Colossi all talk to Wander all the time. They'd all come back. He'd be married to the bird Colossus. <laughs> oh boy, marriage. Whoa. Anyways, Kyle the true Bricker. Colossus. <laughs> That's right. The unscalable Colossus. <laughs> uh, Kyle Bricker from Richland, Washington. 
Yes. He says, Dear G.I. Crew, so I recently saw that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade one-up cabinet is for sale. It looks amazing. Have you guys been able to get your hands on it? I haven't. I tried to at uh, Gamescom this year, but they did not have it out on the floor. I'm very sorry. Uh, but that was the one that I came dangerously close to pre-ordering. because like that one? I love the Ninja Turtles games back in the day. Like Those Konami games were freaking awesome. But in terms, I love Brawlers. I think, in retrospect, <laughs> it's a dumb genre. Turtles in Time rules, though, I to know, this day. I know, but there's something about having an arcade machine that's not infinitely replayable. Like, yeah. you can only save April O'Neil so many times, <laughs> right? Yeah. Never gets old. Uh, yeah, I mean, like you, doing it. having something like Street Fighter or something is fun, right? Mm-hmm. Of just having something that you can never get sick of and it is always a competitive, uh, you know, room to grow. Sure. Uh, but he, so th- um, this person is, uh, this is Kyle, he's worried about the, the size of the thing. Because he's like, I'm 5'10". Is it going to be fine? We have the Street Fighter 2. Get one of the risers that they sell. Yeah. I, mean, I know it's a little bit more money, but like, but it's worth it. But also with TMNT, then it's four players on that tiny thing. It's going to feel <laughs> awkward and oh, cramped. Oh, that's, that's a good point. You have to really like the way your friends Are there four joysticks on it, or is it just yeah. two? Okay. Oh, four. Oh. I mean, yeah. It, it's definitely smaller, but like, uh, if you get one of the risers, it's fine. But if it's only like two of you playing, it's it's also comfortable. Yeah. Maybe you can squeeze three in there, but I think four would be kind four of a nightmare. Four is right out. Um, let's see. Also, have any of you guys watched the new Breaking Bad movie, El Camino? I was very disappointed with the movie, says Kyle. Mm. I haven't. I watched oh, it. Really? I watched it as well. Uh, I watched it on, on Friday. I thought it was, like, I've seen a lot of people make this comparison no on, spoilers? Uh, on TV, mm-hmm. or on, on Twitter, not TV. Uh, Same thing. Modern TV. Yeah. <laughs> uh, saying it, it felt like a good piece of, like, post-game DLC. Oh, that's a great point. It's, it's frozen like it's, wild. It's unnecessary <laughs> and, uh, you know, not as good as Breaking Bad was. Yeah. But, you know, it was a nice, like, epilogue. I'm, I'm in the same camp where ultimately it feels a little bit unnecessary. Um, but it's still, like, six years later for them to create something that I think tonally and spiritually does line up pretty well. I think that's impressive to, like, taking effectively six years off. I know there's Better Call Saul thought of the production crew from the same universe and whatnot. But... It's still impressive that like six years later, here's a new thing, and it's like okay, pretty close. Yeah. Outside of Jesse Plemons' face, pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, though I know we're getting close to Halloween now, but like I thought, Zombie Heisenberg was a weird like touch that they yeah, did in that. Bad call. Yeah, where it's did that Gilligan. come from? What the hell? Um, what are you going to ask for a Halloween show? I don't have anything. Really? Yeah. That's not fun. Um, <laughs> Forrest from Lawrence, Kansas says, uh, to bring out your inner hipster this week. Oh boy. I want, I'm wondering what game you really like that sold really, by the way, Kato, nobody else, <clears throat> nobody else sitting in that seat reads the emails as closely as you are. It freaks me out because I feel you over my shoulder. <laughs> I, and every time I change the word, I'll give you notes after. after <laughs> so. Anyways, uh, I'm wondering what game you're, <laughs> you're trying to look away. <laughs> Just do it normal. Well, you've got it highlighted. I mean, it's just I know, natural. I know. Um, what game you liked <laughs> sold really badly? Titanfall 2. Oh, of course. Recently, I played the Gravity Rush 2 and loved it, which made me slightly sad since the servers were taken offline and the series is probably dead. Yeah, that's a sad one. Titanfall 2. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, it was on sale for like... Five dollars. They would give you five dollars. Yeah. Like around the time that Apex Legends came out and stuff. Oh, I imagine that had to be a significant bump. Please. Everybody on Twitter was like, you missed this game, buy it now. It's yeah. five dollars. And like I still didn't feel like anybody was talking about it, aside from the people who were like shouting from the rooftops ever since it launched. Right, right. It's still so amazing. It was like, yeah, Apex is free though, idiot. Yeah, I hate when the internet speaks to you and it has that voice. <laughs> it always has that voice. There's no other voice that the internet speaks to you. Hey! With. Pokemon! I would, <laughs> I would go with Gotten the, that a few times over the last few weeks. Yeah, okay. The first Nier. Oh, interesting. You like the first Nier? Mm-hmm. I liked it a lot, actually. I wow. I think- it will admit that game has flaws, but I, I really liked it. Um, and so I was happy when we got Nier. Automata. Yeah. Do you think Automata fans... Automata, um, please. I'm sorry, or as... Uh, JV Wilney calls it near a tomato, which is still, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> it's, my, it's the best JV joke. Um, do you feel like fans of that game would be shocked if they went back to the original near? No, I think they'd have a lot of fun with it still. It, it, would it feel in line or is it just a freaky different thing? There's some stuff that crosses over, yeah. um, but it's, it's definitely a different tone and feel that game than, but they're both very like the beginnings are very, uh, 
not not trap, but yeah, it's a sad situation in both games. So I guess that feels the same, but the right. worlds feel very different. Um, yeah. But still, I, I miss that. I really liked that game. I was sad when I saw it did not review well. It did not sell well. But, but somehow they stuck somehow, with it. And yeah. look at how big it is now. Yeah, I still need to play through Automata. Yeah. Just because like I played the intro twice, mm-hmm. and then I get to like the ship, and it's just I never do anything beyond Don't worry. That. You'll never play that intro again. Keep going. <laughs> That's the game is playing it again yeah. and again and again. Uh, Jacob from Raleigh writes in, uh, and he says, hey, we're talking about remasters of remakes and remakes of remasters and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and asking what other examples there are other than Resident Evil 1. He says, what about the PC enhanced version of the Master Chief Collection, which Ah. contains the remake of Halo 1 and 2? They're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to support uncapped frame rates, high resolutions, and a higher field of view. That's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a show though when it came out yes it was the console version though right yes yes but even that i think would technically count where that was a re release i guess of the remake and stuff but but now wait because uh now it's 4k now that xbox one x is out so it's was it like a free upgrade to a remaster of a remake (laughs) (laughs) just blood comes out of my ears uh oh RJ from DR, that's Dominican Republic, um, and Reginican Jerublic. Um, he says, what are you... Anybody like that joke? No. Okay. <laughs> what were your thoughts on the Joker, the film? I thought it was one of the best performances I've ever seen, like Joaquin ever Phoenix. Ever seen? Yeah. He wow. was unbelievable in that role. Uh, that said, they, they made him dance a lot. <laughs> I guess that was his idea. <laughs> he danced. The okay, then I like his performance a lot less. Yeah. No, I, I thought, he. yeah, he was very, very good in that role. Uh, I never thought that I would see somebody, like, take the role of Joker and be as good as Heath Ledger. Yeah. But not, like, outright copy him. Like, take, like, this, all right, let's just do our best Heath Ledger Joker impression. It's like, right. no, he, he made that character his own, and he was amazing in it. Do you think, Joaquin Phoenix, weird guy, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit, a little bit of an oddball. Yeah. Remember that like thing where he was growing his beard and like it was all like performance and art. Went on Letterman yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, he yeah. just like spaced he's out. Rapping. Do you honestly think? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I watched that mockumentary. Now that I think about it, yeah. but it was just like performance art for the mockumentary, right? It wasn't right. actually like him. Like yeah. he did it for like two years, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, it was insane. Do you think he has seen The Dark Knight? I think there's a universe where he's never even seen it. Probably, yeah. I could see possibility. That. Yeah. Do you say it's more likely that he's seen it? More. I bet somebody's asked him that in an interview. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I yeah. bet he's seen it. Because, like, how do you go, like, do a media tour without somebody asking you about, like, hey, what would you think about Heath Ledger's performance? Right, right. Uh, I'm Kato, sure he got that a lot, actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that must be so annoying. It'd be funny if every answer was, like, I didn't even know he played that character. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. exactly. The guy from Brothers Grimm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think is the greatest performance in any film, Kato? You're a bit of a film buff. Of any, wait, his or just any performance of any film? Any film greatest What is the best performance of Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, jeez, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. That's, do I don't, I don't go in for that all time. Oh man, I don't, oh, I don't, interesting I don't conversations. For, what's that? I said, oh, interesting conversations. Yeah, it's like cocktail party. Uh, yeah, this bait is a bit stuff. of a cocktail party. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, where's the cocktail? We all brought our own. Yeah. Nothing. Table. What do you think of? Your mind went to one. Uh, it's Norman Reedus and Destiny. <laughs> 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 he cannot confirm or deny uh, Norman uh, Reedus uh, is in that game. I was going to say something and I had to stop myself. So I didn't know. <laughs> That's good. The conditioning is working. Okay. Do not say anything. What about Joe Pesci and Goodfellas? Is that up there? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, it's pretty good. Uh, I, mm. I, I don't know. You know, there's a lot. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of good. A lot of good the NDA does not extend to other. A lot of good other. performances is your professional take. <laughs> Jesus Christ, who are you, man? I don't know. I'm trying to think really hard of like who I would put up there. I think of like my favorite characters, and it kind of doubles. Like I still love Haley Steinfeld in the new True Grit. I, that's like one of my favorite performances of all time. I think. I think it is. Hmm. I'm drawing a blank. Hang on. Kato's laughing at that suggestion. No, no, no. I'm just laughing. I'm a bit of a Steinfeld nut over here. No, no, no. No, no. <clears throat> <laughs> what are you doing? What's, what's happening, Kyle? You've got some of the questions on my list. What is what growled up your ass? Why are you laughing? So? Kato, are you okay? <laughs> it's great. Right. Everything's great. It's great. Uh, Tyler from Nashville says, Hey everybody, I noticed something lately. Telltale's Guardians of the Galaxy, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, and Sonic Spider-Man, Iron Man VR. 
Um, Ultimate Alliance 3, Square Enix's Avengers. There are a lot of Marvel video games with more that are for sure on the way. It was only a few years ago when DC Comics was praised for their video games like Arkham Trilogy, Injustice, as well as the still played DC UO. <clears throat> That's still online? I didn't think it was, and then I saw it was on the Switch Marketplace, and I was like, what? Oh, weird. What are you doing here? <laughs> um, DC were offering some of the greatest comic book-based video games, but now they've fallen off the wayside. With Marvel overwhelming players with so many games, tables have turned. So what can DC to get back on top? Well, there was a word missing in there, wasn't there? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, what can I DC mean, do? They just need a stra- I think they just need a strategy. I mean, you could always, you could always argue that more is not necess- necessarily better, you know, and yeah, like some it, of the ones that he listed off there. Marvel's that, Capcom Infinite did not, fans hated it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ultimate Alliance 3, people were fairly lukewarm on. I mean, Spider-Man's really the only great one on that list, I think. Right. That's yeah. what I was saying. I don't feel like they've really... But at least like, they're releasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but like at least like the Injustice well, games have they, both been awesome. Here's the, what they need to do. They need to have a freaking Wonder Woman game already. Ooh, what I want. she said That's it. What I want. Would you, if you could have Rocksteady do anything, you'd have, you'd strap them to that ball and chain? Yeah, yeah, Rocksteady. Or they work. make Shadow of the Colossus too. Yeah, <laughs> take your pick. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. I want my Wonder Woman game. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, I think it just feels like there's been a crazy absence because Rocksteady's been cooking something up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's exactly what it's so weird. Like, for five years. I feel like every E3, it's yeah, like, all right. This is going to be it. When's Rocksteady's game going to leak? Yeah, <laughs> and then Stefan Hill has a tweet, sorry, we're not going to be at the Game Awards, <laughs> sorry. Um, Breaking hearts. But then at the same time, Warner Brothers Montreal has been melting uh, mm-hmm. ever since uh, Origins released, you know, and it's just yeah. been project rebooted after rebooted after rebooted. And so, like, with both studios, I don't know if it's fair to call Rocksteady in development hell, but at least taking their sweet time, mm-hmm. it just feels like yeah. we need some powerhouses out there. I really loved all of the Arkham games. Like, yeah. I, I would just, I would not mind just keep churning those out. Well, like, what do you think about the Court of Owls tease that the Montreal? The, I don't even know. Oh, so Warner Brothers Montreal, like, tweeted some teases that they're that they're making a game that's going to incorporate the Court of Owls storyline, which is from uh, the New 52. Yeah. And so it seems like I, I they're making a I didn't see any type Arkham. of tease about that. I've, oh, really? Probably in Japan or Germany or San Francisco. Hmm. <laughs> Take was, your pick. It was right before we revealed the Pokemon cover, so maybe you were heads down Stop and all that stuff. Stop bragging yeah. about all your traveling. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so. drowning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of drowning, bragging, surf's up. Bragging. Sam Harris from Surf City, North Carolina here. He says, hey, to answer your question last week about the stupid ball and cup game, as Hanson called it, it's called Kendama. Ken is the cup portion and Dama is the ball portion. I played this game for an entire summer to camp and he says it's really fun. Oh. I like how a lot of these emails are just like correcting you. <laughs> <days>. <laughs> yeah, it turns out Kendama isn't dumb. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll get into Kendama. You never know. Um, oh, Sadek Raman. Uh, Sadek Raman. I'm sorry. Writes in and says, hey, I'm writing in from Toronto. Also, it's pronounced Misaga. All right, I got that. Another one. Thank you. Um, (laughs) I used to listen to your podcast back in university for some sense of normalcy or for the craziness of student life. You all were just normal adults who were into games. That's how we like to describe ourselves. Are we not normal anymore? (laughs) (laughs) You used to be normal. What happened, man? Oh, gosh. Uh, Now I find myself listening to your podcast on my commute to and from work. I just graduated last year, and it finally makes my commute more enjoyable. Thank you. So my question for you all is, how did you guys find your lives changed after graduation? From getting into careers, um, and how did it affect your gaming habits? That's like the worst the time in your life because you're trying to figure yeah. out what the heck well, you're gonna do. Yeah. Like, especially it when, is yeah. so much. I like the anxiety that hits. I'm like, well, I gotta start figuring out what I want to do for a career now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank I God. have to start applying to those <laughs> yes. jobs. It's like I'm setting up my whole future to be in the workforce for the rest of my life. It's kind of depressing. In you way. know, sadly, I, I would say that, you know, and, and anecdotally, it mm-hmm. seems that this is one of those junctures um, where I think a lot of two people do pull away from games because they say, oh, you know, I'm so busy and all that's kid stuff. I don't have time to, you know, play anymore like we did in the dorms or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, advice-wise, I would say, you just got, you know, stick with it, plow ahead. Because there's going to be all kinds of crap coming your way mm-hmm. down that pipeline. So stay grounded, play some games. You I know, mean, that's when you're looking adult. for a yeah. job or whatever. That's a key, th- fun escapism. Play yeah. game. Yeah. It's so scary, though. Like, Shay, we're the exact same age. We're the same person, right? Yeah. Um, but he was, like, graduating college in the peak yeah. of the Great Recession. <laughs> I was like, oh, what a nightmare. Because yeah. I remember I was working at a community TV station, and I was like, 
talking to my dad. I'm like, yeah, you know, one of the producers left. And so they want to turn me from an intern into like full-time staff. I don't know if I really want that job. And I like, you idiot. <laughs> Take the job. <laughs> like, I guess. Yeah. I waited tables and I worked at like a retail store for like a year. And then I got an office job at a computer consulting company. Yeah. And yeah, it's just like. You, you computer do... consulting? Yeah. What was that like? Did that for several years. What'd you do? Uh, well, one, I was a uh, test coordinator for an application that was being put in for a Fortune 500 company. I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is. Was it still, is it still in development or something? Or what? Still I don't know NDA. if it's still in development. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was, this here? was 2010. Was it Kojima Productions? It was not. <laughs> okay. uh, it was not in the video game industry. Uh -huh. It was in the manufacturing industry. Okay. What was the most important thing you learned from that experience? I don't know, man. Okay. I just, just want to leave that chapter behind. Sure. Um, anyways, yeah, it's a tough transition. Yeah. It like, is. Like, socially it's an interesting and everything. time in life, too, because like, everything's kind of changing and starting up. It also is, like, can be exciting. But I, I've realized when I started talking about that, I was super negative. <laughs> I was like, that's the scariest time of your life. It yeah. is, though. I mean, it, it, no one really prepares you um, for just how difficult that transition can mm -hmm. be. I mean, you're in college actually in like a bubble for like mm -hmm. four years, you know, or right. like you could just, oh, I just have to be responsible for going to two classes a day. <laughs> I, have my, my, I don't have to do that nine to five crap. And then you have to yeah. work from nine to five. It's just like. Also, the worst case scenario for you, Sadek, is now the rest of your life, you will continue having nightmares about accidentally skipping college courses. Do you have like, no. that as well? Actually, I've never graduating had that. or something. I've oh. had that one a lot. Not it's, graduate? What is it like? like? Walk us through. Oh, this course didn't work. Uh, you know, it didn't count. Uh, and then it's like oh. you didn't ever graduate. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have my degree. Do you I'm have most, those dreams, Kyle? The, yeah. The, the, yeah. You, you, you've enrolled, listed for a class, but you keep forgetting Stress to go. It, it's a little, di yeah, yeah. That's more, to, yeah. more to what it is. It's like, you know, you realize it's February and you're like, wait a minute, I, I haven't been to that, that yeah. class in a long time. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> What have yeah. you been doing the whole time? Yes. Oh, that yeah. wasn't a dream. That was college for me. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Mm. You badass. Uh, Why do you think that dream structure is so common? Isn't that weird? For me, it's always like the, the like related to this job, honestly. It's like, oh, really? oh, I published a story like two days before embargo or something mm, yeah, like that. Yeah, I've had a lot of them related to I'm being made fun job. of on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> really? Wait, oh. that wasn't a dream? I'm curious for people to write in for if mm -hmm. you also have that. <clears throat> the college dream. Like if that's the go-to stress dream. Because I don't think I really have stress dreams about this job. But you have them too, Kim? Yeah, all the time. Like this job in college I have. Those are the two that are my stress dreams. Are we living our waking nightmares right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Mike from Northfield, New Hampshire says, this is a killer question. Is 3 a.m. really early or really late? <clears throat> late. Late. Four, yep. that's early. Yeah. I think that's 3 a.m. is late, yeah. It also uh, depends on if you have like an early flight and you have to wake up at 3 a.m. Yeah. Then it's really early. But like I think... <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> Sorry. I have been known to be interesting. <laughs> I have been known to be interesting. <laughs> so I think what, but like our schedule is kind of more in... We're, we're in central time and yeah. our, we're more in line with like Pacific time. So right. like our shift is like you know later than the average working person so it's like our perspective on that's probably a little skewed as well yes it's yeah. like I, I used to go to bed at like 9 30 or 10 oh, and I now it's say, i'm going to bed at like midnight or one well, i was yes. gonna say 3 a.m i'm still up but oh, oh like we boy, said badass yeah breaking controllers screaming at a tv yeah. about iceborne <laughs> uh okay we played this game before and it's unclear if jeremiah from austin texas was the person who emailed it in but it's a damn good game he says, hello, Game Informers. I'm homesick today, so I thought I would send in a video game version of my favorite sick day game show. Oh, I thought he meant he missed his house. Homesick. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, the game is The Price is Right. Ready? So he listed different video games, and we have to guess who is closest to, without going over, in the currency of that game for these items. Again, we've played it before, okay. but you got it? Okay. Right. Uh -uh. The item is... The Giant's Knife. The game is... Shady, you know this? Is that uh, Ocarina? Ocarina of Time. The currency is rupees. Oh, God. It's like 300,000 or something like that. Okay, remember, price is right rules. You can't go over. Is your guess 300,000 No, it's <laughs> something crazy, though. I'll say... Uh, I'll say 5,000. 5,000 rupees? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember upgrading your wallet in that game? Favorite game? One of them. <laughs> okay, Kim. Oh, I have no idea. I'll just do two fifty. Two fifty. 
10,000. All right. What did Barker's Beauty say? 200 rupees. Oh. <laughs> what am I thinking that of? That is a lot. It is a lot for that game, though, right? What am I thinking of, then? Not this. You're thinking of a <laughs> There's number. that one where you really you buy it, and then it breaks. I'm thinking of Big Goron Sword. Yeah, probably. Okay, never mind. There Sorry. There's only one Big Goron at this table, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for the audio <laughs> listeners, Kato just left Hanson hanging in the worst way. <laughs> Story of my life. Okay, the item is an editor's chair... And an editor's desk in Animal Crossing New oh, Leaf. Oh, there's a Game Informer's <laughs> office. <laughs> there's, oh, God. <laughs> supply and demand is all out of whack. <laughs> uh, the currency are bells. How many bells is an editor's chair and an editor's desk? Ten. Ten bells. I've never played Jay. Animal Crossing. <laughs> you maniac. I haven't played Animal Crossing either. What no the idea. hell are you guys doing with your lives? One dollar. One dollar. One dollar. <laughs> okay, Kim. What's the what's the currency 30 bells. exchange? Thirty bells. bells. <laughs> Actual retail price, ten thousand eight hundred bells. <laughs> Kimberly I was, Wallace. Tate. I was so <laughs> close. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> okay, now we're talking. The item is one of the greatest. The Chicago typewriter <sighs> in Resident Evil Four. The currency is pesetas. What is the actual retail price? 70. 70 pesetas. I'm sorry, I'm blowing that. How do you say that? This, what? The Spanish <laughs> currency? How do you say that? Pesetas? Pesetas? Cicadas. Cicadas. Oh, yeah. Kim, how many cicadas? 500. What did you say, Brian? It's a secret. <laughs> no, come on. What did you say? I have no 50? idea. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, said, I think I said 70. 100. 1 million pesetas. <laughs> Way to go, <laughs> Cato. All right, <clears throat> the Button Masher 9001 arcade cabinet. Ooh. The game, The Sims 4. Currency, as everybody knows, simoleons. Simoleons. <laughs> <laughs> I love their commitment to that gag, yeah. though. Sim, 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 sim. Um, what is the actual retail price? And now keep in mind, the series, oh, it's a bit of a cheeky series, The Sims. How much does the Button Masher 9001 arcade cabinet cost in simoleons? Me? Yep. Yeah. 700. 700. Simoleons. 13,000. 13,000. 19,000. Uh, 9,001, right? Wait, what? <laughs> That's not how that works. <laughs> no. Actually, retail price, come on. 1,337 simoleons. Get that leet simoleons out there. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Huh. Do you know that item in the game? I know like a bu- like some of the different um, video game like oh, associated okay. stuff because I do play a lot of Sims yeah. but I just can't remember hey man no me. judgment here the item boxer shorts the game Super Mario Odyssey oh, currency man. gold oh. coins how many gold coins for just boxer shorts oh, 50 okay 150 150 1000 bing 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 I forget what the noise is one of you is exactly right and it's Kato! Oh! 1,000 boxer shorts. Way to go. Okay, here we go. I couldn't remember if that was the really cheap or really expensive one. Yeah, I don't remember what those ones look like. All right, the item is Stick of Dynamite. The game, Red Dead 2. Currency, U.S. dollars, as everybody knows. 15. 25. 35. Ooh. Actual retail price, one dollar. <laughs> Way to go, Cam. All of us blew it then, because we all, all went over. Us. We all oh, busted. Yeah, it's like true. DNT. I was just doing as whoever was clo- I was closer. What do you guys like? Email of the week. I. Oh, it's over already. I like the one about shut the classes too. <laughs> um, I like the one about DC getting back on top. Mm-hmm. What do you guys like? Naughty uh, dog. Post college. Um, yeah. Nihilism. I don't know. <laughs> do you like? Does everybody like post college nihilism? I think you could use... I didn't at the time, but looking back. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, what, so what were the other ones again? Hey, whatever you want, man. Uh, Naughty Dog. Mm-hmm. There is Shadow of the Colossus 2. There is is Gaming Too Easy These Days. Um, all that fun stuff. The game. We shouldn't discount the game just because... Oh, that's true. You know. I say DC or post I like DC. You like DC? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go DC Gaming. And as everybody knows, that is because of Tyler from Nashville. Congratulations, Woo! Tyler in Nashville. Up Good on the big luck. board. Very exciting. Sweet. Thanks so much. 
Uh, thank hey, you. Thanks for being on the podcast, everybody. Oh, thank I you. appreciate everybody taking the time. I know you're all busy with other stuff, um, so I appreciate you know yeah, letting me drag you down. I think the vibe was good yeah. for a new cast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hope. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, coming up now, we have an interview about The Outer Worlds with the game's narrative designer and then also the co-game director. Uh, just a heads up, you know, uh, there was a news story yesterday about how the PS4 Pro version of the game won't be enhanced, but the Xbox One X version will be. Um, they said, yeah, we're not technical. We really can't speak to that. But the PR person ahead of time did say, like, oh, the PS4 4 Pro version will be slightly enhanced. There will be something. It'll be upscaled to 4K in some way. And so <clears throat> I, if you're curious about that very specific nugget, I asked about it. And they said they're going to be releasing a statement you know, probably by the time the episode's up. So you can look for that. Uh, but for now, without further ado, here's Leonard and Natai. Leonard and Natai, welcome to the Game Informer Show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I guess welcome back, Leonard. You were on a while ago for answering the Outer Worlds Lingering Questions. That, that's fun podcast where yep. there's thousands of questions from the community. Yeah, that's fun. And now you're at a point where you've probably answered 16,000 more questions since then about the game. Yep, half of them <laughs> this week. How are, you, how are you feeling about it? How's, uh, how's just the process of doing 1,000 interviews for this game? Uh, well, it's great because you're hearing how people are reacting to the game and people seem to be enjoying it. So that's always rewarding to know that uh, all the work you put in is starting to pay off and people are seeing it. Yeah, for sure. Has there been like one question that surprised you by how many people ask it? Um, no, it's, it, it's not surprising because, you know, I'm trying to think. There's so many that we've been asked over and over again. <laughs> Also, let's see if you ask it. <laughs> oh, great. I promise I won't. Actually, I probably will. Uh, Natai, how are you feeling, man? Congratulations on making it to the finish line. Thank you. I feel really good. Um, I know the atmosphere around the office has been pretty optimistic. We're all kind of relaxed now that the game is ready to be seen and played by everybody. Um, it's been pretty great just going around, talking to the press, uh, getting everybody's impressions on how the game's going. Um, people seem to be having fun. They seem to be enjoying the game. The way we had hoped, you know, for all the right reasons, the, yeah. the player choice, the role play experience, it's all there. It's all exciting to people. Yeah, for sure. When do you guys get to breathe your sigh of relief? Is it when mock reviews come in? Is it when first press reactions start trickling in? Or when is the moment when you can sit back in your chairs and give each other a high five? Uh, there's several stages of that. There's, you know, <laughs> when we finished VO recording, <laughs> which was, which was uh, you know, a condensed schedule for us. Uh, there's when we, you know, submit for certification. They're submitting for the day one patch stuff. So all those are like mini victories. Um, you know, it'll be very um, nice to, to hopefully it'll be nice when we start seeing the reviews come in. Um, but I think it's when it's out in players' hands and seeing how players are reacting to it. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it is out of our hands at this point. And uh, to that end, that's kind of liberating. It's it's good to realize that there's nothing more we can do. We kind of at this point we own up to whatever the game is. For me, the, the moments where I get to breathe a sigh of relief is when I get to see actual fans pick up the game, go through it, get a laugh out of our dialogue, and really see them having fun, because yeah. to me, that's what the whole process is about from the beginning anyway. Yeah, I think... Really, I was just going to say, I'm really looking forward to the streams of people playing the game, seeing how, how many different uh, ways they play it. And Natai, as a narrative designer, you must be sweating a little bit because you know people are just going to be desperate to try and break the game narratively because <laughs> the game gives you so much freedom it's just asking yes. to be broken and shattered yes i am asking for it to be broken and shattered <laughs> i want i want people to feel like this is the kind of game that allows you to do that we're not going to like slap you on the wrist for going off the off the rail or trying to kill a quest critical character we we want you to have fun but like we've created a narrative playground for you guys yeah and uh, if you want to break things go for it and I'm not going to make any statements here, um, but Tim has played uh, the game, I think, 16 times now. And uh, he's tried his hardest to really break the game narratively. Um, and he's only gotten into it so far into a state where it's a little bit weird, but it hasn't broken. So he was at least <laughs> impressed with our... Um, you know, undying dedication to letting players play however they want. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I've been playing it. I, I cannot give my review impressions, but I am just pleasantly surprised by the ability to kill so many people. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, the game's understanding what I'm doing. It's it's a yeah. such a satisfying moment 
um, to just have a game respond to small things, like even acknowledging the clothing you're wear you're wearing and stuff like that. It just like it puts your mindset in a different track of like, oh, I need to stand my toes and look alive because the game is yeah. putting some faith in me. Absolutely, I think that's really the philosophy we've gone with uh, for our narrative is we're not imposing our story on you, we're not bestowing it on you, we're telling the story with you. Um, we're kind of like the co-creators of the story, and the real agency is in the player's hands. Yeah. It's uh, it's wild to think. I think a lot of people's reactions are going to be like, oh, look, Obsidian made another one of these. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's been a while since you all have made a game in this vein. I mean, is it more of a challenge to kind of like shift the skill sets of an entire studio or a fraction of a studio than we'd expect? I personally don't think so. Um, first game I worked on, but I have the backing of a really, really good team of narrative designers who have been doing this for a while. Yeah. Um, the kind of narrative chops that came with the other narrative designers as they worked on Tyranny, as they worked on Pillars, also very good stories, also very much about player choice. I think it translated really well here. Um, I think everyone at the studio is a fan of Fallout New Vegas, and uh, there's a lot of that in the DNA of our entire design. Yeah. So this is familiar territory for well, us. Yeah. yeah, even though Tyranny and, and the Pillars games were, were not first person, uh, you know, the writing really paid attention to your your uh, choices, you know, in, in classic Obsidian fashion. So this isn't really all that different. Yeah. Uh, Leonard, since you've uh, created so many games, you've been in the industry for so long, uh, how do you feel like you've grown now that you're at the finish line for this project? What has been like the biggest leveling up, uh, so to speak, for you personally? Um, that's a really... I don't know. I, I think, you know, you find different problems each time out. Um, I feel like I'm not making a lot of the mistakes I made early on. I'm finding new ones to make. <laughs> um, it's, it's always rewarding. Uh, I'm obviously this is, it's, it's different when you're making your seventh, eighth game, whatever this is for me than making my first one. Um, but it's still very exciting. It's still very, um, you know, just, the, the, the trepidation of waiting to hear how, what people think about it, that stuff never changes, at least for me. Um, you know, when we're in a room um, brainstorming ideas, um, it's a little easier for me to see. Uh, if we go down this road, it's going to be it's going to be really bad for us in terms of all the choices we're letting the player make. So let's maybe nudge it a little bit this way. Um, but because we've chosen to make a game or make games where you can do anything you can conceive of within reason, um, you're always going to have those problems. You're never going to be able to, to grab everyone ahead of time or design your way out of them. A lot of them is like patching them up after the fact. With a game of this scope and just and imagine just the development team is bigger than any team you've directed before, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, is it tough to keep it all in your head? Are you just staring blankly at the shower in the morning trying to remember every, every narrative path, every problem that could happen here? Does it feel like your brain is overflowing that much more just because of the amount of people on this thing? Um, no. Uh, thankfully, I have some fantastic people like Natai working underneath me. Um, he has to sweat over a lot of the details. I'm just there to, you know, kind of give the overall direction and discuss those details and say, hey, Natai, did you, uh, did you uh, consider this one? That's what I, I come up with the, the questions that I'm going to needle in the tie and the other writers with in the shower. Oh, it's like I'm going to I'm going to harass them today about whether they consider this way of playing this, this scenario or not. <laughs> and it's how you're driving into work every morning, just preparing your defense for like, OK, no one's going <laughs> to bug me about this. No, this is going to be a thing. Uh, yes, we considered this option. No, we can't do it. Here are 50 things that are going to break if we do. <laughs> uh, the, the, the weird thing about it is that like early on, um, or I'd say right in the thick of it, you know, people come in and they're like, well, how does this work? And you can give them not only how it works, but like how you came to that conclusion and why you made that decision and all these different aspects of it. And then, you know, a month later after we finished recording and I'm not in the thick of it as much anymore, people will ask me something and I'll be like, wow, I forgot about that already. I got to go talk to the writers. I'll be, I'll get back to you. <laughs> what does the home stretch look like for Unitai? Is it just watching play tests for like the last year or what is the last like six months say been like for you? Um, it's been quieter than the six months before that. Yeah. Uh, I've actually been lucky enough. I've been able to offer my help to like our PR and marketing team, um, help like shape some of our messaging going forward. Um, talk to press, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of retrospective work. There's been a lot of like looking back 
at the arc of our work from when we began with Vertical Slice to where we ended up with um, Alpha and uh, the VO work and trying to see in a postmortem way, okay, what can we do better for next time? What have we actually learned from this? Uh, are there any missteps that we want to avoid next time? And also like what really worked? Um, a lot of development, especially from the narrative side, is trying like 100 things and 80 of them resonate really well. And paying attention to what works and what resonates really well is uh, as important, I think, as paying attention to the things that didn't quite work out. So that retrospective period is important because not only does it bookend the entire development cycle, but it helps inform me going forward into future projects. Yeah. What is in that 20%? What did you notice that, uh, eh, let's scale back on this part? Scale back? Um, that's actually harder to measure uh, because it's not something that we get feedback on. Like if there's a lot of stuff in the game that we put tons and tons of effort into and not a lot of players found it, I think there's still a good argument to be made that we should have those kinds of secrets in the game. But it's mostly like, let's find ways to do what we wanted to do, but more efficiently. Can we do the same thing with, with like 20% fewer words and make it more clear to the player? Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into making the writing look natural and feel natural, but it, um, I don't wanna say it's artificial, but it's all very like rigorously planned. Um, so like improving that pipeline is part of it. Yeah. Uh, Leonard, with the start of the project, um, and your, your bold dreams of what this game is, and now looking at, hey, this is on the disc, ready to ship. Uh, what's the biggest difference? What stands out to you? Like, oh, I never could have guessed it would be this. Um, I think it's the same as with every game. You have so many great ideas, or what you think are great ideas at the very beginning of the project, and then as you go, some of them turn out to be not so great. There's some you just have to leave by the wayside because they couldn't fit in the game in the time we had. Um, so that never changes. Um, and it's really, that's another great thing about having it in people's hands, players' hands, streamers' hands, watching them play, hearing their feedback on it, because you get so close to this stuff at a certain point, namely now, you're seeing a lot of the things when you see, your, when you play it yourself, you're remembering de decisions you had to make because of time or because of resources. Um, I think overall, um, you know, I'm really happy with how we were able to get the feel of the world that Tim and I came up with originally, um, really get the feel of the corporate dystopia and the, and the silliness crossed with the dark humor. I think all that stuff is very successful. Um, and it's one thing for us to say, this is what it's going to be. And then for to have this team of, of, of great developers, you know, help us, you know, achieve that vision is just, just very rewarding every time. Yeah. Uh, what's been your favorite moment in development? Um, I think one of my favorites is always um, when we're doing the VO recording huh. because, you know, we, we've lived with the game with the, we call it robo voice, the automatically generated um, VO uh, for so long. And we try to write stuff that has some nuance to it. And a lot of it is humor, which has to do with timing. And, uh, you know, spoiler, robo voice doesn't have any timing. <laughs> um, so, you know, getting actors in the booth and just hearing them interpret the characters that you've been slaving over for so long and having them really come to life um, and bring things to the character that you never even thought of that, you know, then turn around and make you look like you were such a great writer to have brought this dimension to the character. <laughs> um, I just, I mean, our VO acting is, is just great. I love our VO actors. Um, I think that was really, and also early on when we really kind of started to get in the groove of what the world looked like was also a very exciting thing for me because I had a pretty vague idea of what I wanted, but if I had to be the one to implement on it, I'm not quite sure which direction I would have gone. There was a couple different paths we could have taken. Um, and Daniel Alpert, our art director, really kind of ran with that and, and created this fantastic looking world with his, with his team of artists. What about, what are you thinking, Ty? What was your most uh, satisfying? Moment? Well, so I'm always a big believer that storytelling is not just the sole purview of narrative. Um, so to me, it was always very exciting when our concept artists would take like our companions or our major NPCs and bring them to life through their just incredible art. Um, because, you know, working in narrative, very often these s characters who are central to our story, they live in our heads, they live on like wiki pages. But when concept artists and just uh, animations and modeling get their hands on that work and bring that to life, that's very exciting. I'm, I am also a huge fan of the entire VO process. Um, I find it a bit humbling because you get to see that 
again, it's not just the words on the screen which convey the story, but it's the talent and the skill that these voice actors um, who have you know, honed their skills over a long time. We have some very experienced voice actors on this project. Um, they bring the characters to life in a different way. Uh, yeah. That to me is always an exciting part of the process. For sure. How important or influential is just um, an avalanche of goodwill coming in from the internet towards Obsidian? Because I think it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride with you guys. Yeah. Where you could not have had more. It seems like the Epic Games Store announcement was a bit of a low point. And I'd imagine yeah. gearing up towards launch, people are feeling good again. How how much does that impact the day to day mood of developers in the office? For me, it's it's critically important. I, I've always believed that um, goodwill is is very very difficult to build, and it's very easy to lose. And um, at the end of the day, I'm I'm making games not for me and not for other people in the studio. It's for fans to have a good time and to enjoy it. So of course we want to cultivate goodwill, and of course it feels good uh, when you spend you know a couple of years of your life making something and fans really love it. And it sucks if they don't, but but just having the fans' attention and them giving X number of hours of their life to the game, I find is is particularly humbling too. Like people could play any game, but they're playing ours, and to yeah. me that is awesome. Yeah, Leonard, it has to be bizarre to be developing games for so long to just have this aspect now of just the internet shoveling feedback uh, into your brain at all times. I don't know how active you are on Twitter and whatnot. Maybe you're healthier than most people. But I mean, especially with like Obsidian's community, because I feel like for so long you guys have been so open and transparent with the crowdfunding, and now you're making a game that isn't crowdfunded, but I'm guessing a lot of that community still has that mentality of like, let us tell you what we want, sir. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, we've been making, not just me, but Obsidian as a whole has been making RPGs for a long time, so we have a pretty good idea of what our, our fans are looking for, um, and fortunately, it's the kind of game we really love to make. Um, I don't go much on, on things like Twitter. Um, I, I, I used to have a Facebook account. I still check that every once in a while, but I kind of stay away from social media, um, not because of any kind of righteous um, st political statement or anything. I just... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm a little old school on that front, I guess. Um, but, you know, the fans and the outpouring of support and just the interest and the, and the trust they have in us um, has just been very humbling. And every time it's like you never, at least I don't, end up taking it for granted ever. Um, you know, when people are like, well, you must have known that, that there was going to be this, this great uh, interest in what you and Tim were doing. And I'm like, well, you know, I was hoping, but I, you know, that's nothing you can ever count on. It could have been, you know, the response could have just as equally been, well, you know, you guys haven't worked together for a while. We're not quite sure whether you could do this again. Um, but from the very beginning of the announcement, um, it's just been really positive, And that's always great to have. Yeah. Is uh, Tim already in Hawaii relaxing or what's he up to? No, he's just back at the office, probably on his 17th or 18th playthrough. <laughs> Perfect. What is it's um, definitely not something he told us to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is like the biggest aspect of the game that was influenced by fan feedback? Was there something that you guys are proud that you got in there that maybe you didn't expect because a lot of fans were asking for it? Wow, that's a good question. Honestly, I don't think there was this ever a team meeting or a design meeting or a day that went by where we weren't talking about, let's implement this this way, because I think fans would expect that, yeah. or fans would really love it if you had this kind of option here, or fans expect to be able to play this way, so let's, let's support that as much as possible. I personally really think that the option to play a low intelligence character all the way through the game, yeah. and have like almost a different experience because you've got dumb dialogue options, is 100% for the fans, um, it's something that has received a lot of positive feedback, and I think it's going to be a very popular way to play the game. Yeah, absolutely. It must be nice to get you know so much positive feedback from fans, but also from Microsoft, who who purchased Obsidian uh, within this game's development. Because clearly, it's like all right, getting the nod from a giant corporation about a game that uh, has some thoughts on giant corporations is a bizarre <laughs> situation. Uh, so we had uh, Matt Booty from Microsoft on the podcast a while ago. And he had some kind words to say about the Outer Worlds and what the future might hold for Outer Worlds. Can I read you his quote and get your reaction? Sure, sure, okay, sure. Great. So I was talking about um, just like with the studios they purchase and whether they'd want those studios to be fully 
Xbox exclusive moving forward, or I guess I should say Microsoft exclusive versus like still letting them release games third party and whatnot. And this game is coming out to everything to be clear. But he says, yeah, I think that'd be that kind of game talking about the future of the Outer Worlds as an Xbox exclusive. Uh, he says, and from what we've seen of the Outer Worlds, my hope is that it's something that we can build that is really that it really becomes an enduring franchise that really starts to grow and that we can help expand. I think it's a great universe they've created. I think about what are the things that you need for a franchise to bear weight. Um, does that feel like an extra amount of responsibility? The idea that Microsoft is, uh, champing at the bit to get their hands on this franchise. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll let us keep developing it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I think that, um, it's kind of what you originally said. It's, it's nice to hear that. It's nice to, um, have the people who have, who have purchased your company have such faith in what you're doing. Um, you know, and the fact that it is, it is this corporate dystopia, um, was was ironic, um, but you know we haven't heard anything from them about that. Um, they've just been very supportive. The marketing support they've given us has been really fantastic. So so far so good. It's 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 going really well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really think the idea that this could become an enduring franchise is something that adds responsibility to me. It's it's fairly natural. Like the Outer Worlds feels like a natural setting to write in. It's very easy to write in. I think it lends itself very well to um, dark humor. It lends itself very well to funny storytelling, to adventure. It kind of, I think it sits really well in this broad, uh, spectrum of, of stylized science fiction that we have. There's like fallout, there's Bioshock and there's us. And we obviously draw from, uh, a bunch of different sources, but I think we're distinct and I would love to see the outer worlds turn into like a lasting franchise. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And we all know that money's great. But is there something that might worry you about like, all right, Outer Worlds 2, here's Microsoft's uh, $400 million go. Do you want to keep this a smaller project moving into the future? That's a balancing act because um, the, the, hopefully it's successful enough where people want more of it um, and, and success breeds its own kind of um, you know, requirements. Um, and as the budgets go up, uh, there's more concern about you know the direction you might take the the project or the franchise um and we haven't seen any of that yet obviously but you know so i i don't necessarily know that we'd want this to be a 400 million dollar game i mean i like a smaller budget we have to grow with the times and be competitive so um this was a sm very small budget for this tile of game and hopefully we're bigger next time around but i'd like to keep it a little bit on the smaller side i feel like that um gives us more creative control um, in terms of what is in the game, um, it, it, it helps us focus. It helps us make a, po a polished game. Yeah. Um, it just, it feels better to me. Plus, you know, we don't want like a 250 person team, um, having a team where it's, I mean, 70 people is a large team, but it still feels like a little bit of a smaller team. People on the project don't feel like they're just, just part of, uh, you know, just doing one thing over and over and over again. They can feel like they're part of the creative process. Um, that's very important to me that people who are working on the project feel like their voices are being heard and that they have a say in what we're doing. Yeah. Do you feel like this franchise could work in a fully open world in the future? Possibly. I mean, the, the thing there that's difficult is that, well, not difficult, but I think the franchise leans a little bit away from that yeah. in that, you know, it's a space, uh, pulpy space sci-fi opera where you're a guy who fly or a woman who flies from uh, place to place, you know, exploring a solar system. So to have a giant, one giant map kind of like defeats that. Um, depending on the size of each map, that's, you know, that's that's time, that's resources. And, you know, we're really um, interested to hear people's feedback on, on how they feel about the length of the game. Because right now, a lot of people who have played it, you know, jump right back in to play a different type of character. And that seems to be a really positive experience for them, which is what we were hoping you know, so if then we turn around and, and make something that's 80 hours long, whether that would contain that same kind of excitement for them, whether that would be better or worse, we have to wait and hear from the fans on that. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Um, oh, go ahead. I'd be curious about that, too. I don't I don't I'm always skeptical of this idea that that seems to be going around in, in AAA development that um, open world is kind of the standard that if you're going to have a very big budget game, that it should be open world. I think. Um, it's very easy to get burnt out on open world games because they tend to be so sprawling, so massive that every open world game you play tends to be kind of the same thing. Go here, collect that, see that landmark. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a lot of value in having an open ended game that is still structured around individual discrete levels. And um, 
it also tends to be easier to develop. I am always a fan of making the most of the budget that you have. I think that's what we did in this game. We didn't have a great, like a huge budget to start with. We had a relatively small team, but uh, we concentrated on using that budget wisely to make a game that would like satisfy what we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the fact that it's so open-ended and that we really want to react to what the players are doing, if it's a little bit more contained play spaces, that gives us much more control over how many different ways they can approach a situation, um, which ironically makes the players feel like they have more control and the game reacts better to them or yeah, to their choices. For sure. It's just so refreshing to play a game like this and it's like, oh, it almost reminds me of like a structure of the first Mass Effect. I'm sure a lot of people have made that comparison, but it's like, yeah, I was just yes, gonna, I'm craving that. I think about that a lot. Uh, the fact that Mass Effect does kind of the same thing. It, it is a pretty open-ended game, but there are individ individual discrete levels that you can go to, and yet it feels like a big, expansive galaxy where you can kind of go everywhere. Like, that, I think, is a very valid way to make RPGs also. Yeah, and as we learned with Mass Effect Andromeda, opening that world up even more, it has its consequences. Uh, it has it's tricky. It has some problems, yeah. It's, it's really difficult. Um, awesome. Well, hey, how are you guys planning on uh, celebrating the launch day? What, what's the game plan? Just everybody watching streams all day in the office, or...? Uh, we have actually a signing event that we're going to be oh. doing um, at South Coast Plaza, is it? The Xbox store at South Coast Plaza. Cool. Um, I don't know if we've announced that yet. So, And Mikey's not giving me a dirty look, so I guess it's <laughs> probably fine that I've, I've let the cat out of the bag there. And we're also having a launch event that night uh, where the whole company is going to get together and, you know, celebrate the release of the game. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, congratulations, guys. It certainly seems like you accomplished what you set out to do. So hats off to the team. Oh, thank well, you. thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time. And thank you for watching and listening to this episode of the Gameformer Show podcast. Be sure to tune in next Thursday where we'll have an interesting episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye.